Mozo? Here. Carol? Here. Bernstein? Here. Mayhem? Absent? And Jane? Here. All right. We'll now open with public comment. Any member of the public like to address the board on any item that's not on the agenda? Seeing nobody and having no uh, speaker slips, we'll close that. And we'll move to the approval of the minutes of the Single Family Design Board for May 27th. Do we have a first and a second and then any comments? I'll make that motion. First. First. And then comments? Okay. As the people present, okay, that's page 11 from Nice Woolery Landscape Designer. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, on item 6, I'm not sure, I thought this was part of the motion, but perhaps it didn't make it in the motion, um, that, that the driveway is to be permeable, fully permeable if the ribbon drive, driveway was not to be used. Is that right, correct. Glenn, you and I were the first and second. I don't remember that discussion. I mean, I remember the discussion, but I don't know if it got put into the motion. Hmm. I'm thinking about a permeable drive. Is there a way of checking the video? And I think on that one, it might it'd be worth worthwhile. So, on Gloria, just check to see if the motion stated a permeable driveway. And while we're on item six, which is 122 La Plata, are there any other comments from any other board members? I had one. I want to stay on, okay. we should go by, by addresses. Actually, on item, one, um, item six, on the comment one, or comment two, it says to provide project statistics. I want to cross out the word Excel and printouts and just say FAR calculations. I know I verbalized the word Excel, but that doesn't need to be there. Just FAR calculations. And then on comment four, it's just um, correct the tower design to match the presentation drawings because the computer drawing didn't match the hand sketch drawings. And delete the word FAR calculations from item four. So let's uh, go back and be methodical. Item one, are there any comments from anybody? Item two. <coughs> Oops. Oh, you are right. Let's go back to under discussion items, which is the top of page four. You had some, you have some comments, Bernie. Um, I was wondering if other people on our board felt that the language of the paragraph was a little bit um, not clear and could be rewritten. seems to represent the general discussion. Is there a specific thing that you think is unclear? Yes, thank you. Um, the paragraph that to me was confusing was the fourth sentence where it says, without some degree of consultant details at the final review, just the whole way that those next three paragraphs three sentences. are sentences, I mean, um, just, it's really confusing, I think. And I actually was wondering, you know, the one about staff does not believe that the intention is to, that's so confusing. Hmm. 
Okay. Um, the one comment that I remember Mr. Mahan saying is that the drawings needed to be complete, the details needed to be worked out at some point, and until the drawings were resolved, there's always going to be outstanding issues. Um, I remember reading this, and it, and it wasn't clear to me, but I didn't want to make an issue about it because um, the staff's intention is to make the drawings available at the review point because that needs to be clear that if we ask questions, the consultant drawings needed to be finished so that we had some surety that the design bugs have been worked out before we give it final. Mm -hmm. That seems to represent what we talked about, yeah. Okay. Tony? Mr. Chair, and Bernie, that sentence that you were just mentioning, where it says at the end of the sentence, maybe needed to make a quote-unquote buildable project, if instead of saying that, what if we said may necessitate a review after final or, you know, that's the issue. They might have to come back again for a review, for review after, after final. final. That's okay. Mr. Chair, yes. thank you. Could we maybe just take this aside and have somebody work on the grammatical structure and what we're trying to say and then approve it at the next meeting? Mm -hmm. with a corrected version because it's not only that one word it's several things and and I think it's just a linguistic thing video yeah Heather Baker worked on this okay. she drafted this part of the minutes okay uh, that's that's when we go through the minutes we'll, we'll we won't approve that one section we'll leave that outstanding okay, okay. So to cruise through the different addresses, item one, did anybody have any comments? Item two, three, four, five, six we already talked about. And item seven. Yes? Show retaining walls and driveway. Uh, I believe you sh that was your project, and you were showing the driveways on the on the plan. Show the retaining walls on the site plan. Correct. Yeah, just eliminate and and driveway. On item four, okay. And number eight, we talked about. Were there any other comments on number eight? And that is all. So we're, oops, yes. Thank you. Um, I had something on page 12, on the and I just wondered, it's on, uh, on a final review on 306 El Monte. Okay. It was just, I was wondering if it said um, existing asphalt driveway with new surfacing, if we were, if we had said permeable surfacing or if we had given any direction to the new driveway, the new surface. That was done at consent calendar. May I pass it to you? Remodel. I'm just going to read it quick. I honestly cannot remember if the if, it, if the drawings address that point or not. So we don't have an answer. And whether or not it was, but the plans were approved as submitted, and that was discussed two weeks ago when we approved the uh, consent calendar for that day. Okay. So for that applicant, it's a, it's cast in stone. So I'm going to modify the motion for approving the minutes, pulling out the discussion item. Is that okay with Glenn and Aaron? First and second. Yes. Okay. All in favor of the minutes as modified. Aye. Opposed? An abstention? I will abstain on item 7. You want to abstain on item 8? Okay. Denise will abstain on item 8. Alrighty. Moving on to announcements by staff. Oh, I'm sorry. Back up. Consent calendar for June 2nd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let's see. Consent calendar for June 2nd, 2008. Item A, 3718 Lincolnwood Drive, final approval with condition. Item B, 940 Fellowship Lane, final approval with conditions. 
Item C, 1484 Lacima Road. Uh, is continued for staff approval with conditions. Item D, 731 East Anapumu Street. Uh, final approval with conditions. And that was it for consent calendar on June 2nd. That was reviewed by Paul Zink. Okay, a motion to approve the consent calendar as read. First by Denise, second. Second. Uh, by Gary, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Consent calendar for June 9th. All right, consent for today, June 9th. Item A, 1801 Las Tunas Road, final approval as noted. Item B, 182 La Vista Grande, final approval with conditions. Item C, 911 Austin Road, final approval with conditions. Item D, 1072 Garcia Road, final approval as submitted of the review after final. And item E, 1520 Santa Rosa Avenue was continued indefinitely back to consent. And today's consent calendar was reviewed by Glenn Deisler. Thank you, Glenn. Um, do I have a first and a second? First by Bernie, second by Aaron. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Now we'll move to announcements. I don't have any announcements. No announcements. Who wants to cover the Built Green comments? Oh, yeah, that's on our agenda as an announcement. I, I will mention that. Um, Friday, June 13th and Saturday, June 14th at Santa Barbara City College, there's a Built Green Expo and conference. And it says here, free admission, free green building seminars throughout the day, and a Built Green tour on Saturday the 14th. Thank you. First come, first serve. I think you just show up. You can look at the builtgreenexpo.com. All right. Any subcommittee reports? Not this time. Moving to possible ordinance violations. None. So let's move on to the first action item, which is the city outdoor lighting and street street lighting design guidelines. Good afternoon. We'll have you state your name for the record and your presentation. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, board members. I'm John Iwasiak. I'm the principal civil engineer for the Public Works Department. And this is Steve Haas. He's our uh, committee member and representing the HLC. And we'd like to tell you a little bit of who we are and what we're doing and uh, how it may pertain to your review. Before so, you start, go ahead. can we make sure that television is hooked up to the same thing that's on the front? Thank you. Is this the same as that? Uh, it looks different, but I'm sure it's pretty much the same thing. It's the same, yeah. Yeah. Shape different. Go ahead. Thank you. I'd like to give you a little bit of background, if I could, with the first slide. The background is that uh, streetlight issues and lighting issues have been discussed uh, at boards and commissions, and there was a need for uh, improved guidelines. Specifically, we had uh, uh, outdoor lighting guidelines, but not street light guidelines. And so um, there was also a need to replace existing obsolete street lights. And so these, all, these things came to a head. Next slide, please. And in March of 2005, our city council approved the formation of an ad hoc committee, the Street Light Designs Advisory Group and to develop recommendations for the council's consideration regarding streetlight planning and uh, guidelines issues. So an advisory group was formed consisting of a council member, a representative from the boards and commissions at the time, uh, the Planning Commission, Historic Landmarks Commission, uh, Architectural Board of Review, the Transportation Circulation Commission, and the two public works managers. One has since retired. I'm, I'm the other, but his replacement, uh, Mr. Dewey, the Energy and Facilities Manager, is, uh, the, is the second public works manager. Next slide, please. So the Streetlight Guidelines Advisory Group was established and um, was working with the boards of commissions, and we talked about many of the uh, issues at hand and one of them became that uh, we needed to coincide with our outdoor lighting regulations so that they, they would go hand in hand street lighting and outdoor lighting 
would have uh, had common issues. And so the outdoor lighting uh, reg, uh, guidelines were approved in 1997, I believe, Steve, that's right, and, and have been in existence, but they were, were, didn't really speak to the street lighting. So when we were working on our guidelines for street lights, it became apparent that there were common issues and that there was a need to update the existing outdoor lighting guidelines as well. And so we were evaluating the lighting styles, lighting issues, fiscal impacts associated with street lighting. And I do want to make it clear that there is no city budget for uh, updating street lighting and that on a project by project basis, that's how street lighting gets improved in the city. And so it's just important to recognize that because um, of the fiscal, fiscal impacts of resulting. So back in 2006, we made a initial uh, presentations to the boards and commissions to let them know where we're at at that time. And it was subsequent to that that the outdoor lighting guidelines were, um, were worked on. And I'm going to turn it over to Steve House to talk about uh, the primary component that you may be interested in, which is the outdoor lighting component. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you. Well, let me just add to that that uh, it seems to me that street lights aren't really in your purview when there is a project. When there's a street light involved, it would probably be ABR that reviews it. But certainly, if you have any questions about the street lighting component, we'd be happy to uh, talk to you more about that. But in the process, basically, a map was developed. Uh, that kind of showed the distribution of the different types so that, you know, when somebody needed to know what's the appropriate type for this area of town, you know, there's a document that kind of helps you graphically find that. And uh, there have been some new introductions, pedestrian lighting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the outdoor lighting guidelines, um, as John said, didn't originally start out being part of the street lighting project, but uh, Mike Grimes, a former facilities manor, manager, suggested it would, uh, made sense to put these two together. So we minimize the number of different documents that are all over town, and uh, uh, you know, it just um, just made perfect good sense to do that. Um, of course, that precipitated a need to update the thing because they were nearing 10 years old. Um, and I don't know how many of you have read the summary of changes. I prepared that just because the actual uh, lighting guidelines are a pretty lengthy thing. And um, we, uh, we tried when we first wrote these and uh, continuing uh, now to not make something that's too technical a document because we recognize that a lot of different users are going to use this. There are uh, architects, there are lighting uh, designers, electrical engineers, public members, people from out of town. I reviewed a lot of different um, existing lighting ordinances and guidelines from around the country. Some of them were just uh, touchy-feely about night sky and others were very technical and you know you would glaze over trying to figure anything out from it. So interested in your comments on, on, on any of that, the usability. We have 10 years of experience uh, this being in existence. And uh, um, this summary of changes highlights what's different between the original one and the new one. I would say mainly we've learned from some past experiences and added some additional categories. That would be parking garages. Um, we uh, ATMs was another one. So these obviously aren't things that uh, come up in, 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 in your purview. Um, but I know that in the revised single family design guidelines, there is a lighting component. And as I have reviewed that document, I don't see really any gross conflicts or anything. Um, however, it does discuss, um, I forget how it's put, maybe uh, the appropriate wattage and, and also shielding from neighbors. Um, it seems to me that there are some issues that could uh, bear a little bit more discussion. Um, wattage is also a difficult way of going about it because a 100 watt fluorescent light versus a 100 watt incandescent uh, light are two different animals. Uh, so lumen output might be a different way. Um, it seems to me if there's an interest that since um, we've been working on this since before this committee uh, was formed, uh, maybe we could use 
uh, somebody from your committee to be on this advisory group and, and uh, give us your input on, um, on, on working on fine-tuning guidelines for residential. Um, unless you've looked this over and you find that um, hey, that works just fine, but uh, invitations out there. Thank you for the invitation. Mm -hmm. um, any questions or comments from the board members? Let me also add that this is an evolving document, and um, every time we think we're getting close to finishing, uh, there are more things that come up. And International Dark Skies Association and the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America are working on a model lighting code, uh, which um, jurisdictions can adopt. We think it's kind of premature, since that's not out yet, to hold off and see what they say. I think that we have basically a pretty good document. Um, oh, lost my train of thought on that. But, uh, you know, and then there are other issues um, of changing metrics of, of, of cutoff fixtures. Um, dark skies are certainly a primary concern in hillside neighborhoods, uh, but we also recognize that as long as we have a lot of lantern type fixtures downtown, uh, downtown Santa Barbara is never going to be a dark sky community. Um, so, you know, that's another topic that might be addressed if, if uh, one of you have to sign this uh, subcommittee is uh, dark skies. I actually have one question reviewing mm -hmm. the single family design board for lighting for driveways. There's nothing that says that you can't have the, dot, the lights, you know, every so often to light, illuminate the driveway. Mm -hmm. And what is your committee's feeling on something like that? Well, that's not addressed um, specifically. There is a section on site lighting and landscape lighting and building lighting. Um, so that comes the closest. Uh, we discussed whether or not to have more language concerning uplighting of trees and uplighting of buildings, etc. Uh, at the same time, we've tried not to get too restrictive, but you know, once again, it's a guideline, and so ultimately, a design review board is going to have to use uh, um, their judgment on these matters. Uh, my personal response to that would be: it all depends on on the, the type of light and the wattage, the uh, fixture. lumen output, fixture. Yeah, so uh, certainly, it would be desirable to not see direct view of a lamp. I mean, that's generally the primary right. objective. Um, that's come up in this committee when we review long driveways, the pathway lighting that goes up, and, then yeah. and, and really our ordinance does not really say you can't do that. Mm -hmm. It just talked about fixtures and the wattage size and perhaps solar yeah. and other But issues. it certainly would be useful if whatever is said about lighting in the single family design guides was consistent with what it said in here, okay. and somebody could go to one document and find the information they need and not be in conflict with another mm -hmm. one somewhere Great. else. Any other comments? Yes. Yeah. No questions. Um, good comments on the driveway, by the way, because the string of pearls on hillsides and so forth can be a problem. Um, I was looking at this, and you have uh, on the second fixture, you have obsolete fixture and pole. And then the third one down there, you um, have this as an alternate fixture, but you're not saying the areas. In these little ice cream cone type that we're talking about there in some areas on the APS and so forth. These acorn ones? Yeah. Mm -hmm. were, it, was it meant for that to, to, to be um, a substitute or, or were, were you planning on using some other type of pole in those areas? If they're obsolete, what are you planning on using? Mr. Chair, um, regarding the post top street light that has a globe top, um, those fixtures and actually some of the poles are obsolete, so they, they do require a replacement of some type. So we, we would expect that in those locations that they exist, that's the Loma Alta or the Alameda Padre Serra areas where these exist, is that they would be simply substituted with in-kind or comparable types so that we could retain that post-op historic uh, fixture and style. But it would need to be with a, a new... new um, lantern or fixture and pole that we could order again if hit or, or main, to, to maintain it, etc. So that's the idea is to maintain our existing inventory of lighting, uh, add, um, add additional lights and poles as appropriate, 
as deemed appropriate by the boards and commissions but to basically maintain what we've got in our city so in order to do that we have to find substitutes for those obsolete fixtures and poles okay a couple more questions that answer your question somewhat I was really hoping that it would be using the same ones or well let me add to that one of the objectives in the street light effort was to minimize the inventory that the city needed to maintain I mean if every neighborhood that gets developed comes up with their own street light design that's just a huge kit of parts that the city has to maintain so the well and there are you know we've already gone down that road but to the extent that we're recognizing that was a problem and we could do something about it we wanted to try and work with a smaller kit of parts and yet achieve variety that helps define neighborhoods etc certainly these acorn top ones are character defining as far as certain neighborhoods like APS and other places that they occur some of the parts for some of the existing fixtures are no longer available but there are similar ones and there are technological advancements that can help direct more of the light down and growing less of it up and you know so it's just our objective to try and strike a balance keep the aesthetics of a traditional feel without looking like something too high-tech and yes because I do understand there's different types of bulbs that you can get that are directional and also shielding recently and that's not on this board on the ABR we've seen two projects one is going to be on Ortega Street and I believe one is on Moose Street and there's slated for some lighting change there and we weren't we were kind of on the board we were kind of going back and forth of what that lighting fixture would be and and the same thing happened right here on Harbor Heights on the hill that go on the road that comes back down to Korea with the Loma Alta. Is this Loma Alta here? The Loma Alta there was some concern about some street lighting on that one as well. In this guideline I'm not really seeing what in these in these residential areas is appropriate and I know that that uh, most of the board and most of the times we really aren't appreciative of these cobra heads but um, what is it that we are, we should be looking at is there a direction for us to point towards saying what should be mr. chair and board members generally speaking one of the the catalysts for this effort was that the some of the boards and commissions were disfavoring the aesthetics of the cobra head fixture and so our our advisory group has devised a game plan where that it's in our guidelines to phase out the Cobra head over time again there's no capital project or budget to, to do that but on a on a project by project basis the Cobra heads are envisioned to be substituted with any of the inventory that we have but we've introduced the domus fixture that's the green bell type fixture that you see on your plans and you've seen some of those fixtures appear through individual projects such as cottage hospital etc so there is an envision that that the Cobra heads would disappear over time and that the appropriate fixture per on a project by project basis but but generally speaking we see the domus is appearing more more readily or to as the substitute basically but again it's going to be the boards and commissions they'll be able to to have these alternate fixtures be considered for their areas there are cost issues associated with that for example any metal poles need to be painted concrete poles do not need to be maintained other than graffiti that may appear but that's the true for it for any any pole and so there are in our guidelines where we are establishing that or recognizing that the preferences to have concrete poles were appropriate the HLC has shown a desire to have metal poles in the HLC in the El Pueblo Viejo district and so that that is their purview and and there's provision for that so generally speaking we see the Cobra heads being phased out did more domus fixtures appearing and and unless there's an area specifically where you could extend existing fixtures and styles that are in the inventory 
for example, Carrillo Street, um, State Street. There could be continuations of those styles up and down those corridors. And on this plan, you see some shaded areas called opportunity corridors. And those are areas where the possibility of, of existing styles being continued further or a new style that's on the inventory that could be introduced in those areas. So there are some options for the boards and commissions and our facilities maintenance uh, staff with Public Works. We'd like to work hand in hand with the boards and commissions to come up with appropriate designations of, of lighting. So there's, op there's options and there's opportunity. And so we would ask that the guidelines speak to limiting the numbers so that we don't have to store parts for uh, an infinite number of fixtures and, and poles. So I hope that answers then your or responds to your, your it's It somewhat does. <laughs> well, I had one question. If someone in this board wanted to be on your on your subcommittee, mm -hmm. what is a time commitment? What, how often do you meet it? And just Sometimes a year passes before we meet. <laughs> well, then it's easy to find a volunteer yeah, from this board yeah. to be part of your board. Yeah, we are trying to get it wrapped up. Um, you know, we are. This is the first time we've been before your board, but we have been before the other boards and commissions a uh, first time. Um, we hope this will be maybe the last time. Uh, it's looking like planning commission might not be till August. Is that still the case? And then on to council. So not a lot of meetings. It's mainly just you know somebody from your board to really read this over and see uh, if there's something that you feel should be in here or don't agree with. Enforcement is another thing that was added. We never really right. had a tool for enforcement, and obviously that's an issue you have. Something gets installed and it's not what you thought was going to get installed. You know, so that's. Um, Thank you. Another issue. Let me just ask, Jaime, do you have anything that you'd like to add or anything we've missed? Yeah. Mr. Right. Chair, the single family design board would be called on to review street lights if they're proposed as part of a residential subdivision. Okay. Generally, street lights would be reviewed by either ABR or HLC. True. So, um, at this point, I, maybe someone from our board will contact you directly if they're interested in being on your board, okay. since it's small purview. But thank you for bringing us up to date on these different issues. And the lighting guideline, what we mainly say is refer to the outdoor lighting guidance guideline, mm -hmm. and you need, mm -hmm. need to comply to that. Yeah. That's in our motion. Yeah. Well, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We will move on to the next discussion item which is the Manual for Post-Construction Stormwater Management. and board members. Thank you for having me. My name is Autumn Malanka. I'm with the City Creeks Division. And uh, today I'm presenting on the City's Technical Guidance Manual for Stormwater Management. And this is specifically for post-construction stormwater management. I recognize a couple of you, so you've already seen this presentation because we've already been to ABR and HLC um, with this item. But we wanted to be sure to get to all the boards and commissions because we think it's an important um, opportunity for the city to have guidance on these water quality regulations that have become um, more and more stringent and actually a challenge to, to meet uh, on a site-by-site -site basis. So before I get started, I wanted to address a couple of things up front that seems to continuously come up about this draft technical guidance manual. And first off, it's that it's large. It's pretty overwhelming. It's a big book. And um, what we're trying to explain to everybody is that a good portion of this is a rather technical section of Chapter 6. And that gets into the engineering um, criteria and design guidelines that get really specific for actual design. 
and so that the, the technical aspect of this technical guidance manual uh, takes up about 220 pages of this massive document and the rest of it is appendices. So really, when we're asking the boards and commissions to review, we're, we're giving the guidance to try to look at chapters one through five. That sort of gives a better sense of, of what this document is about, what the goals are. And um, another comment that seems to come up quite often is the fact that a lot of the photographs in here don't seem to really pertain to Santa Barbara. There's a lot of pictures in here that um, look very reminiscent of, of, of um, Portland or Washington, you know, some more of the green, rainier states. So um, my, my manager, the Creeks manager, Cameron Vincent, and I have actually been working on collecting some more local photos. So what you see in here is just placeholders, and those will be updated with more local examples. Anyway, with that, I'll get started. So what I wanted to go over today is that we have federal, state, and local requirements that focus on water quality and, and stormwater management. And due to those requirements, the city already has the stormwater management program. It's this other really large book, but we've become more familiar with that because city council um, approved this document back in 2006 with the guidance and direction to actually start implementing the goals and um, management items that are recognized in our stormwater management plan. Um, and the reason that we have this is to improve water quality, reduce erosion and flooding, and also to conserve water. So those are kind of the hot, hot uh, ticket items that we're looking at. And I should mention that the Creeks Division is, is really just sort of the administrator of the city's stormwater management plan, but it should be very clear that this is a city document, as, as is this technical guidance manual. Um, so how are we meeting these federal, state, and local requirements and, and actually trying to improve water quality and stormwater management is through creating this technical guidance manual, which is the equally massive, massive book here. And um, what the SWIMP says is that in year one of implementation, we'll create this guidance manual. And it's something that we've, been, we've known is, has been a need for, for quite some time in working with the design review staff, um, a lot of applicants who come to the city say, well, how are we supposed to meet these requirements that are listed in the stormwater management plan? How do we do that? How do we capture and, and treat water quality? So that's the intent of this guidance manual is to show us what are the best management practices to achieve the, the goals and requirements in the SWIMP. So the, the SWIMP, which we've had in place now for, for a couple of years, has six chapters um, they're called Minimum Control Measures, or MCMs, and what we're focusing on is MCM 5, or Chapter 5, in the Stormwater Management Plan, which is post-construction stormwater management, and that is where it says the city shall produce a guidance manual that tells the, the public and city staff on how to actually build and size stormwater management best management practices. Next slide. And rather than just following these, these books that are tell us what to do, like, you know, marching ants, we, we need to really kind of take a step back and think about why are we doing this. And this is a list that's known as um, the 303D impaired water body list. It's put out by the State Water Board. And it recognizes that all of these um, listed areas or water bodies within the county of Santa Barbara, within our region, are technically impaired by the state. They, they have high bacteria levels or other, other pollutants of concern that have been identified. And what we've gotten read here are the actual beaches in Santa Barbara and the creeks that are listed on this impaired water bodies list. So you can see that just about anywhere where a creek meets the ocean, we've got problems. We've got pollutant, pollutants of concern, as well as the entire stint, six miles of Arroyo Burrow Creek, and close to eight, nine miles of Mission Creek are impaired water bodies. This uh, report was just recently put out a couple of months ago by Hill the Bay. Um, it's a nonprofit organization down south, and it's basically a report card that they give to different communities, you know, as they track our water quality. And the point of, of demonstrating this slide here is that the dry weather is, is we've got an A, basically. It's, that's not really necessarily where, where our trouble is. Our trouble is during the wet weather when we have storm water runoff. 30% um, 
was we had a good a good mark, but 25% uh, was a C and 10% was was a D or failing, actually a D an F failing. So it goes to show that we have a, a good percentage of of um, highly polluted waters that come from stormwater runoff, and that means that it's a non-point problem. So runoff comes from all different areas within the city. We're not a, a larger industrial city where there's a big industry discharging their waste into our ocean. It's just simply runoff from individual parcels where there's hydrocarbons, bacteria, sediment, construction materials. So again, the year one of our stormwater management plan says to address that problem, we develop this guidance manual. And in year two, we actually develop a stormwater ordinance. So it puts it into regulation, and in year three, we adopt the ordinance. So this guidance manual is technically sort of a trial in, all right, how are we going to solve the problem so we can actually implement an ordinance a couple years down the road, just sort of start trying some things out. Next slide, please. So we got to work back in November, Cameron, Vincent, and myself, and hired a consultant team, and that's Geocentech Consultants. They're a local consulting firm here in town. They're actually um, an international firm, but we're lucky enough to have a good, uh, good group here in town that are familiar with the local conditions here. And they formed a subconsultant sub group of Pinfield and Smith Engineering. So we have our hard engineering team. David Black and Associates is the landscape architects that looked at these designs. And then the Low Impact Development Center, which is actually based on the East Coast, but they have some West Coast representatives that um, help review the, the low impact designs that are incorporated into the manual. We've had a huge outreach effort in this, in this, uh, in developing this manual that started back in uh, late 07 and early 08. Um, there was a subsequent outline that we shared with the different boards and commissions as well as the general public and we have a stakeholder group that I'll get to in my next slide that saw that outline. The draft manual just came to us in May, early May, so we've only had it for a few weeks now, and we're planning on continuing on to bring this to uh, the Planning Commission mid-June and then July, hopefully mid-July or late July, we don't have a date yet, to uh, get this to Council. There's the list of, of our outreach effort. I'd say Cameron and I have conducted Oh, it's probably approaching about 50 meetings now in the past six weeks, um, both individually with, with interested participants as well as stakeholder meetings. We've, we've formed more of a core stakeholder group that includes uh, prof um, design professionals, contractors, home builders, landscape architects, um, engineers, as well as obviously environmental groups, um, Hill the Ocean, Santa Barbara Channel Keeper, Environmental Defense Center. And then obviously we've been meeting with city staff throughout this whole process, um, focusing in on planning, engineering uh, mainly, but we've also met with, with every other city department that we can imagine might have some sort of invested interest in how these guidelines pan out. Next slide. So again, the intent of the manual is to help our city staff as well as the local architects and engineers, the professional design community to meet the requirements that are already established in the SWIMP and that the city has already been implementing into projects over the past year or so, and to demonstrate the designs visually um, for development and redevelopment projects. Next slide. I sort of mentioned the contents before I started. So chapters one through five give a good basic background as to what low impact design, designs are, how the city is proposing to capture and treat stormwater. There's an introduction. Uh, chapter two talks about how to assess your site and what BMPs would actually be appropriate for, for different areas. Um, chapter three talks about assessing your soils, infiltration capabilities. Four is site design, how to actually look at your entire site and design it with, with stormwater management in mind. Chapter five addresses the basic BMP options, something that any landowner can incorporate. They're easy, they're inexpensive. That was the goal of, of chapter five. And chapter six is the technical um, chapter that gets into the actual stormwater runoff requirements and how to, how to meet those. The threat threshold table is something that we've been working on. It's been an ever-evolving table as we continue to meet with city staff and stakeholders 
But the idea is to look at different levels of projects and try to implement stormwater best management practices that are appropriate to different project levels. Um, tier one are small residential projects that are less than 500 square feet of uh, development or redevelopment. And those are projects that don't have to incorporate stormwater management requirements. They're, they're too small, so we call them voluntary. You know, any homeowner can actually look at this manual, and if they're interested in water quality and capturing stormwater, they can read through the basic chapters and figure out how to do that. Then we've, we're trying to define a line as to, all right, then when do we actually want to encourage uh, private property owners as well as commercial properties that are smaller and not necessarily held to the high requirements established in the stormwater management plan, but that should still incorporate stormwater management BMPs. Um, projects, we call those tier two or medium projects, uh, between 500 and 4,000 square feet of new or redeveloped area. And those, uh, that tier two focuses just on chapter five where the check mark is, which are those basic BMP options that I talked about. Um, they're basically uh, redirecting the rain gutters down into landscaped areas obviously far enough away so you don't get infiltration into, into your um, sub-base or sub-grade. But simple things that are inexpensive and easy to do. And then again, Chapter 3 is actually meeting the stormwater runoff requirements, and those are um, a little more technically challenging but doable. The whole idea is to identify BMPs in Chapter 6 that can actually apply to the, to the Santa Barbara region and the area and be implemented with, with the engineers and architects of a, of a project that would be required for a tier three project. Next slide. These are the sort of things that the manual identifies, just to give an idea of what we're talking about here. I already mentioned redirecting downspouts um, to either vegetation or to rain barrels. That old fashioned design is actually making a comeback. And then bioretention is the encouraged BMP um, infiltration or, or flow through designs that includes grass strips, bioswells, rain gardens, planter boxes, detention bases, and, and dry wells. Those are for bigger projects. Green roofs, if you're gaining more and more recognition across the, the nation, they've been in Europe for a, a long time. Pervious concrete, and of course, proprietary devices, things like mechanical filters. So just a couple examples to talk about how this would actually apply in real life. If you take a smaller project like a single family residence uh, who would be implementing a tier one or tier two level BMP for stormwater management, they would have you know, obviously a smaller level of development between 500 and 4,000 square feet of new or redeveloped area. And they just choose a basic BMP, it would be a checklist that the planning and building and safety department would have and you choose what's appropriate for you for your site. You show it on a simple site plan, circle the area, and you're done. The whole idea was to keep it simple and easy, especially for the city staff to implement. Next slide. This is just an example. The picture there on the left actually shows the array of different things you could possibly implement, but we're not asking, obviously, you know, for a homeowner or somebody to implement this many BMPs. It's just kind of shows everything on one site, you know, rain gardens, previous walkways, uh, cistern. Anyways, and the idea is to use the manual to look at your soils, your slope, your roof area, and thereby figure out which BMPs are appropriate. Prepare a sketch. Show it on a simple site plan and you're done. Next slide. There's a picture. Again, the bottom one is redirecting your downspouts. You'd have to have an extension on the bottom there to get it away from your foundation. And the top one is a rain garden with a curb cut. Directs the rainwater right into the nice filtration area. Next slide. The other project example is that the larger commercial project that would come to the city and that's a tier three project. Um, they choose and implement stormwater BMPs based on what are the requirements in the stormwater management plan, which has peak flow requirements. You can't increase peak flows. You have to capture and treat a certain amount of water. So there's volumetric and treatment requirements that are, that are specified in the swim. And the more technical designs or biofiltration 
uh, infiltration, permeable pavers, uh, building BMPs that are also seen in Chapter 5. The basic BMP options can be used for Tier 3 projects as well. And retention and detention BMPs are proprietary devices. The good example of a commercial project here in town is the Hayward Center over on Olive Street. They've got a really great um, permeable paved parking area with gravel at the front end for the drips, the hydrocarbon carbon drips, and it all sinks into a big cistern, I believe it's a 5,000 gallon cistern underneath the parking lot. And then that rainwater is pumped back up to the planter areas. There's a copper gutter there that distributes rainwater. It's kind of in the shadows. It's hard to see, but they, they reuse that rainwater for, for irrigation. They have quite a bit of planted areas there in the front, front area. So that's an innovative storm water design that's just a couple blocks from our, from our office. Next slide. Just a couple more photographs of other uh, commercial applications. We've got a bioretention kind of planted area within an office area here that looks really nice but has a very specific job. In the lower right-hand corner is obviously some more permeable pavers for hydrocarbons. Next slide. So um, for implementing this, this document, once it, it becomes a little more finalized um, over the next month or so, um, the City Creeks Division has put some money in our budget to have a training program, so we'll be able to train both city staff and some you know, out, uh, public um, professional design community people. Um, so that will be coming up later. And um, we also talk about the fact that because this is such a large document that it would be nice to develop a brochure or a smaller, you know, magazine that's very short that's more um, user friendly. It just has more pictures and it's very basic. And so that's something that we want to create that will be really um, more accessible to the, to the homeowner and uh, people who don't want to get into the technical details of this document. So that's something that's on our to-do list. And the manual is a working document. This is something that's intended to be constantly updated. Um, the designs in here, a lot of people say, where are you going to see wet retention ponds in Santa Barbara? That doesn't even apply here. And that's true. We tried to be more all-inclusive of designs rather than exclusive. So, so there's actually more options in here than may be even necessary. And there's the, the um, possibility that we can add more options to this as different applicants come to us with different ideas that could work just the same. So that concludes my presentation. Any questions from the board members? I actually had one. Yeah. Tier 1 was for projects that were under 500 square feet. Tier 2 was between 500 and 4,000 square feet. How did you determine the 500 square feet? It seems a little too small, and it should be like more like a thousand square feet. We heard that. Good. Yeah, we tried to um, take examples from other cities that have actually already started implementing these guidance manuals for stormwater, and we started looking at um, where the state water board is going with their requirements as far as what they're starting to expect. Their um, expectations are constantly changing, and 500 seem to be a uh, happy medium. It's not overly aggressive. It's not underly aggressive. It's, it's, um, it's similar to what a lot of other cities are doing. Portland is an example. Um, but some other cities are even, you know, re requiring a lesser, a smaller amount to actually start incorporating BMPs. Can, can I ask that question to the board members? Since we do a lot of residential projects, um, 500 okay. square feet, if someone has an idea of what size that is, uh, um, well, if you think of your two-car garage, you're 20 feet from the sidewalk, mm -hmm. and you're you know, maybe 20 feet wide, that's 400 square feet. So they're saying as soon as you do more than 500 square feet of ground disturbance, you're going to be in a tier two. That's so right. does that seem, how does what are the board members feel about that since we do residential? Yeah, that's a good way to ask it. Because the uh, tier one was voluntary for small projects. Tier two was for medium-sized projects that were, had involved more than 500 square feet to 4,000, and then tier three. <clears throat> my my personal is like every single project that we do in the city will be a tier two, and a tier one does not exist because 500 square feet is too small of a number. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to see what, how other people thought about that. 
pretty common. Yeah, 500 square feet is really small, but uh, tier two is pretty minimal on what the, what they're asking for. And then eventually, because then it goes up to a 4,000 square foot, which is basically a single family home. Which, I mean, which a is, home and a patio and driveway and all those other which things. Which is really what they're, they're, you're doing a lot more and you're doing a lot of site work usually when you go in 4,000 square feet. But there's not a lot of site work on a lot of additions that are over 500 square feet, which most of this pertains to is site work. So You run into a problem where someone's going to do an addition in the back of their house and it's going to be a 500 square foot or someone's going to redo their driveway right. and it could be you're going to go over that 500 square foot threshold very quickly mm -hmm. and then they're going to be looking at this additional burden. Right. I think... No, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, that leads into what I was going to say. I think what's important to note is that um, we've recognized as a city that, that this stormwater runoff program is such a cumulative effect. It's coming from everywhere. You know, it's not just site specific. And so the idea was, gosh, how can we capture some of it? You know, not just from these bigger tier three projects, but even from people who are doing these smaller uh, projects to make something super simple so it's not, you know, cost prohibitive or, or you know, too difficult to understand you know, but actually try to make some progress towards the goal, which is improving the water quality and decreasing runoff. So we worked really hard to make the Tier 2 BMP options very, very basic and, and affordable, relatively speaking. So um, that's the idea, the, the, the rain barrel you can get for 100 to $150 for a, for a you know, 50 to 75-gallon rain barrel. And you can capture, you know, water, the first flush, you capture that little bit, the first flush, which actually seems to have the most pollutants in it. So those are the ideas. One of the problems with the rain barrel is, though, is that you've disconnected your downspout and you're no longer, a, you no longer have your property protected from rainfall. You've got a barrel that's connected to a downspout and it's, once it's filled, it's going to spill. One of the things they have, uh, in Europe, and I incorporated this in my own house, is they have these little, actually, the they have these little uh, trays, these little, uh, little, oh. like, open things. And you can open them up, and it diverts the flow into a rain barrel, and then you can close them back up, and they go back to, into the storm drain system. And I, I haven't seen any here yet, but you know they they work for two things you can use a filter to clean your gutters and then they you also do tilt them sideways and they go out to a rain barrel mm -hmm. and i was wondering if you could think about it yeah. something like no these. I've, I've seen these and i think that sometimes it's even actually part of the rain barrel purchase mm -hmm. these, oh, these valves yeah. that you can yeah it's, I've, I've been researching rain barrels and it's pretty i know just what you're talking about but also usually rain barrels will have an overflow, overflow. valve here and they will usually come with mm -hmm. a a tube or some sort of like hose that you'll take and direct it to wherever the rain would normally be flowing from the downspout. So once it gets to the top of the barrel, it will actually flow to where the rainwater would normally flow out of the downspout. That's sort of the, the safety mechanism and, they've come up with. And the other thing I was wondering about these big retention basins that you're talking about or, or subterranean uh, what, what does vector control think about this with all of the mosquitoes? Um, how are you planning on taking care of that? Yeah, that's something that we've met with the county health department on because that was a question that came up really early on. You know, we don't want standing water in so many different regards. And so um, a lot of the designs in the guidance manual account for that, um, whether it's underground or it's actually every once in a while it's... Um, agitated because agitated water can't can't grow mosquito larvae so there's different design things that they've come up with that actually take the vector of problem away not obviously there's more than just mosquitoes they, that you have right. to deal with but yeah the county health department's been helping us review that and sort of try to avoid that problem it's a good point is another one of those Yes, absolutely. That's in there. I think it's both in Chapter 5 and 6 as BMP options. It's a, it's a good one.
Well, thank you for your presentation. Are there any other comments from the board? I have one question. Um, I only had a chance to browse through this. Uh, are there any plant lists as they pertain to certain applications, such as bioswales, detention basins, et cetera? Yeah. Good question, and I haven't studied it even as closely as I should have, too. I believe it's in the, one of the appendices. Um, the local, uh, David Black has been part of, of helping make sure that that's all local plants. And, okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to the regular agenda. We're right on time. Item one, which is 561 West Mountain Drive. It is a proposal for a three-lot subdivision and construction of three single-family residents on an 8.8-acre site in the Hillside Design District. An existing single-family resident with a detached two-car garage would remain on one of the parcels. Each of the proposed single-family residents would be one story with an attached garages on the lower level. The proposal includes 1,450 cubic yards of grading outside the footprints of the building. So your name and presentation, please. Uh, my name is Rich Ridgway with Investec, and we're here to talk about uh, the Jorgensen Ranch project, and specifically this application is just for the roadway construction, because the actual the homes will be coming back at a later date. Cool. All righty. So the issue really is um, there's an existing approximately 12-foot wide asphalt road that by fire department standards needs to be widened to 20 feet and that will end up um, eliminating some trees along um, the edge of the roadway. So we're widening that roadway and we have um, originally the thought was to lay it back at a two to one slope and after looking at that it was going to nuke a whole lot of uh, oak trees. So we actually along the edge of the new paved section we have a retaining wall that varies from three feet up to its highest point where the highest cut is at about six feet. And we have a stone-faced um, wall that runs um, along a cut that happens in this area. And then the rest, uh, there's some real minor riprap for some real minor grade changes. A stone, stone wall, which we have done a lot of, we have some pictures of those. So that's what we're here to talk about today is just that road section because we're hoping to get into plan check and start the construction of the roadway and there's it's emergency because we were conditioned by the city to work only from July 1st through October 15th. That's our window of opportunity. We don't want to wait another year. So we'd like to get this behind us and we were told that um, we needed to come see the ABR um, again prior to getting a permit start or prior to even getting into plan check for the roadway construction. And so here we are. Um, they suggested we come to Single Family Design Review Board instead, because ultimately we will come to you for the homes. And so here we are today. Now, when this was reviewed by the city council, did they review the oak trees being removed, or was it just in concept? They only? knew that there were oak tree removals. There was a tree removal plan, which they took a look at, um, pretty much as you see. And so we went through ABR, we went through planning commission, we got approved for a four lot subdivision planning commission, we were appealed by the neighbors and the city council reduced us down to three lots. Um, one of the lots has an existing adobe on it so that one is restricted with, um, uh, well, it's just, um, what would you call it? It's a historic landmark they determined and so structure of merit structure of merit so we're not really allowed to do any changes to that so we really have two new homes here and here but we'll come back that's right at a later date for that. now do you have a plan that shows the height of the, of the um, we have full-on civil engineering drawings does someone want to see more detailed drawings of the height of the retaining walls and the grading along the way Civil plan, you said it varies between four feet and six feet. Three, three through this area climbs six to at six worst. at this area. Okay. And you're using real stone versus the, or what kind of stone is this? We're proposing. Oh, El Dorado. I'm sorry. I'm seeing something here. And dry stack. Where, the dry stack. Dry stack is occurs where you see the these areas. Yeah. 
Okay. Not a lot because this road is already in and we're just widening through here and then widening along. It's actually along the whole right side of the road. We're widening in that extra eight feet. Okay. Is that all for your presentation? Well, we have a stone column at the project entranceway, which Planning Commission and City Council have seen. We have two uh, rocks that indicate addressing and direction of the roadway. And those happen out uh, here and here. And the Council and Planning Commission and ABR have looked at those the previous time as well. And the location of where these were was has, not changed, has yes. not changed. Has not changed. Has not changed. I might also comment, my name is Charlie Eckler with Investec, that there are three homes down here that share the access. And as such, we also will need to thin some of the growth that is in this area so that the approaching vehicles will have the opportunity to see each other. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is correct, lifting the skirts. And it is just something that now makes uh, visibility almost impossible. And so the, the council, the planning commission, they all saw this need and approved it. Now, is this pruning trees in someone else's property? or that's... It's within our easement. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Well... Our conditions of approval, I'm Michelle Velarde from Invest Tech. Thank you. Our conditions of approval specifically have items that need to be reviewed by ABR, which I'm assuming now is single family design. Correct. So um, I don't know if we need to go through each of those so that we can go you know, into plan check that these have been reviewed. Let, let's um, just quickly go through the list. I'll read through the items and then we'll go to public comment and then we'll go back to questions from the board. Talks about stormwater pollution control. You were listening to the previous presentation. <laughs> okay. Design review. Talks about the tree removal and replacement. Are you replacing the oak trees? Yes. And where is there a plan for that? It was the first tree. Some of them are 10 to 1 and some of them are 2 to 1. Is it colored differently? Yes. The ones that are replaced versus... The squares around, so the trees are listed, show that the green squares are the smaller trees that are replaced at the 2 to 1, and the red squares, so they're by the number. So you can basically look at the number. I'm sorry, she didn't hear you. Sorry. You can look at the number. Um, basically of the tree, so 20, for instance, would be removed. And then you can see the box around number 20, and that will tell you at what rate it would be replanted. It's replanted with, according to a red box, you mean? Yes. Around the red the box 20, then yes. then on a 10 to 1 basis? Yes. The green box is mitigated on a 1 to 1 basis. Mm -hmm. So show me 10 red boxes. Okay. In the listing of the trees. Oh, okay. Did you see... 175. This one. There's 12. Yes. Okay. I'm, we're slowly getting it. And those trees are to be replanted in these areas that are marked on the plans, as is would be appropriate for spacing. Can we bring that to the attention of the landscape guys? Um, the, re the location of where the replacement trees are to occur. Do you see that on the plans? Here, 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 and here. So they have zones where the replacement are going to occur. And mostly at this time it's due to the fact that we're trying to stay out of the construction zones eventually for the homes that will be built. Okay. These are also areas that will benefit from the additional screening so that the neighbors and ourselves will have more privacy. Makes sense. The tree protection measures, they, I see them listed over here. Do they follow what was in the conditions from the yes. Planning Commission? Exactly. Contacts with an address and a biologist who come out and monitor as we go through the construction process and prior to. Are you planning on relocating any oak trees? No, no, all replacement. Okay. And that was the recommendation of the arborist. The landscape plan or tree protection plan shall incorporate the following information or notes about the needle grass transplation, the scrub oak, live coastal oaks. Is that noted somewhere? The live coastal oaks and the scrub oaks are actually what they're, what are noted um, in the different types of trees. 
So you'll the see in the, the treatment. The grass happens to occur up in this zone, and so we won't be anywhere near that. And one last question. Um, has the fire department reviewed this plan? Yes. And at, at what point have they given it a little stamp of approval for you to get into the building department yet? Or? They've been out so many times and have supported right. our project at multiple hearings. And, and provided and approved an evacuation plan for workers on site. We've, we've gone to a, a unknown levels, okay. <laughs> previously unseen. Well, this doesn't have to do with, with design, a lot of these things. That's I'm just correct. going to say that the uh, planning department has got the work cut out for them in reviewing it. Okay. Anything else you want to bring to our attention? I'd like to open up uh, public comment. If you can slide over and we'll have a person come to that chair. I'd like to call Cody Campbell. Campbell? Hi. Thank you. My name's Cody Campbell. and. Um, I was mostly concerned with the little comment down here that said construction of three new single-family residences will actually be two. Okay. And I didn't understand about the um, rock wall. It's difficult to hear when the voices are going That's forward. Fine. I'll show you the drawing that they pointed out to us. They have a picture of a drawing here. We'll rotate it towards you. Thank you. The wall is a CMU block construction with a stone veneer, and the stone veneer is being called out as an El Dorado sandstone veneer, and it's a precast concrete material. And the height, based upon the discussion, was going between three feet and six feet. And where will that be? It was starting at a point over here. And going on there. I and see. He was pointing to, to this area as where it was the highest. And where where is the shrubbery that is suggested to be cut down? In this triangle. Okay, that's so the, the Christian yeah. okay. okay, and I'm sorry. I I live at um, five fifty nine, which is the next house right. over here. So um, I'm familiar with this road. Right. And and what was the reason for cutting this down? Visibility, safety, traffic. It's in our conditions of approval that it has to be 18 inches or lower. The city okay, and that's that's that. for traffic coming out of 561? It's for the benefit of oh, both people that yeah. come out of this lane. Okay, and how far is that going to have to be cut down? To 18 inches is the maximum height in that area. 18 it's, inches? Yeah, it was in the resolution from the when we came out of them. Um, and I'd like to clarify two, two drivers can see yeah. over. You know what? Yeah. I need to stop the. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, we need to have. You and I are having a conversation. Okay. Your question has to do about this yucca tree and where it was going to. And, and the reasons for it to be cut and the heights right. of it. So yes. uh, our board will ask them some questions. Okay. Yeah. Right. Do you have any other concerns? Or? Um, no, it was mainly the cutting down of the shrubbery and how high the um, the wall was going to be. The wall along this end. Okay. Right. Great. Well, thank you thank for you. coming thank down. You. Thank you. Well, we'll start with um, a question for the applicant in the sense that the removal of this yucca tree, this shrubbery that's at the corner, that was part of the planning commission. Yeah, it's number seven on page eight of the resolution. Okay. And time out. Do you have those civil drawings? Let me borrow those real fast. Ask Gary to look at those. Is that civil? Yeah. I'm just asking about it. Yeah. Great. And I lost my train of thought. Number seven is that it requires 18 inches for the landscaping in the triangle. It says that the landscaping within the island located at the fork in the private access easement shall be maintained at a height of no more than 18 inches. Existing landscaping that impedes the driver's or pedestrian visibility shall be removed. Existing trees whose canopies are tall enough such that, that they do not interfere with the sight lines for drivers or pedestrians can remain. And if I may, I would suggest that that was pertinent because there is a tree and even the yuccas 
the yuccas properly thinned and kept at their tall height do not present the problem, but there are shrubs that do need to be lowered so that you can see through those. They, they uh, present an impenetrable barrier as far, as far as visibility. And so the trees do stay, and I think yeah, that's important. Yeah. How, did you, how, did, how did they determine this number of 18 inches versus 42 inches? We had uh, Associated Transportation Engineers come out and assess this site, and that was from their letter of recommendation that you, if you brought it down to 18 inches, then the cars coming up the hill, which are at a lower elevation, would be able to see us, and we would also have the ability to see them. And so it was all based on uh, tr truly a report done by the professionals. All right. Is this in the chair? Yes, staff. I received a letter uh, from a neighbor for, You're right. regarding I'm sorry. public comment. Thank you very much. Um, and she would just like you to consider the routing of any trucks required for the project um, because there are other projects going on in this area right now, and there's been a lot of truck traffic in that area. Um, and that's it. Please consider having a flagman at the intersection of Foothill and West Mountain. And at Sheffield. Okay. Are there any other public comments? Then I'll close public comment at this point and return it back to the full board for questions. Are there any questions from any other board members? I have a, a couple questions. Um, first, there seems to be some oaks on here that could be saved potentially. Why, why are you moving them? Such as 141, 142. You know, you'd probably need to physically see those. There was a fire that burned much of that hillside. I don't know how many years ago, and so a lot of that is sucker growth out of old stumps. So those are not any of those in that area are not in good health at all. Uh, Peter Wynn did the assessment, and based on uh, recommendations of West Tree is how some of this came, and, and uh, some of these trees are just not healthy, and so it seemed a better thing to remove them and then take replanting into the landscape plan for the homes when that comes before you. Okay. My second question was, it seems to be a lot of trees to be, new trees to be planted. Um, it seems as though there's some areas that could use some more oaks, and you're limiting yourself to these smaller areas. Uh, the theory, you know, a, a 10 to 1 replacement, they're looking at us and we're growing uh, from acorns, saplings, and the theory is the survival rate isn't 100%, it's the goal I think is 20%, yes. or is it 10% anyway. So we're going to be planting those areas thickly and hoping for the best. Um, and so I don't think all 184 saplings that we plant will survive. That's the intent. Any other questions from any other members? I have a question. Um, right now we're reviewing the road and the road improvements and oak tree removals for the roads. Yes. So you also have a couple of red X's eventually where the new homes are going to be. Any particular reason why these oak tree removals are included in this permit that we're reviewing for just the road? I think it was basically an aspect of having the tree people on site to accommodate the removal of the trees at one time. And so as we were looking at that, we assumed it would be an appropriate time to go ahead and remove that tree. We'll also be removing a couple of trees that are really a fire danger issue. Those are eucalyptus and, a, and dead pine. So it was the workers and uh, the equipment would be on site. So we were looking to take advantage of it. And I think as well to get the new growth started. So if we waited for several years on removal of a couple of that are in really poor health here anyway, um, they may not survive the next couple years on their own with no development. But if we were to remove them now and get the new growth going in their place, Ultimately, you get a healthier grove going. Okay. Any comments? Yes, Bernie. I have a couple of questions. Um, 
I guess I'm concerned because you're telling us that we're just looking at the road mm -hmm. only, but that's not what our agenda says. And so just wondering if our agenda says we're looking at the homes and why aren't we talking about the homes? Well, let's ask half staff answer that. Well, the, the footer on the agenda explains the, that it's a review, the print. what we are reviewing here. And, Tony, there's one correction that was brought up to our, t our attention. In the motion, it says three new single-family residents. It should only be two new single-family residents because one of them is an existing structure. Okay, and we are only talking about the road because that's what's talked about in bold. Review a private road and associated tree protection and removal compliance with conditions and approval. So based upon the way that this is written, I don't feel comfortable with sort of saying you can remove the other trees on the property because that that's these trees will be taken care of when the home is being taken care of because the home could be redesigned in a different configuration. I don't think you need a permit from us to remove a dead tree if it's dead so you can take care of those. The eucalyptus, on the other hand, if it's alive and it's, that's, we're not here for that. We're here about the road and the associated tree removal as well as tree protection for the construction of the road. Does that sound reasonable for the other board members? Okay. Mr. Yes. And I have a question about the road, only about the that's road. Okay. Um, is, are there any other retaining walls in the vicinity that are as high as six feet tall? We haven't gone and done a survey of the neighborhood, but we really have no options other than um, because on the west edge of the roadway, there's a grade change and a drop off, and the fire department requirement is a 20 foot paved surface. So holding the edge of the road on the west side and moving to that 20 feet and then building our retaining wall is really our only option. We took this approach also because we felt that it, it did help us preserve some trees and also meant we were going to be removing less dirt to get to that 20 foot wet width. If we have to lay it back rather than have the retaining wall, then that is going to be a, a, another amount that has to be removed. And what is the approximate linear length of this retaining wall? Oh, we'll have to get a scale. Is it 30? You can do it right here. It's 30 scale. Is this it? Yeah, it is. So how many? And there is. Looking close to about 300 feet. And I would also like to emphasize that at this end, I mean, we're, it's a very low wall as we move this way, and this is the area that really will require um, a wall, and the and the extra height is where it takes place all in that section there. Mr. Chair, yes, Gary, uh, um, it's the, it's that particular uh, section that that the applicant has just brought up that I I may have some concerns with that wall. Um, at this point here, there was talk. Can we actually move that drawing here? We could. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not sure, but is this the section where you were talking about where you needed to trim the yuccas at? Right here. Yeah. Okay. One of the things that I'm concerned with is, is that there's a driveway right here, and we have a six-foot wall right here at this point. Where, do you have, where does it note the height of this wall? We have grade. We have top of um, we have top of wall. And six foot here, but it sure climbs to it right in this. Um, let's see. Here it says top of wall is uh, six seven. Here, and uh, that's the beginning of the wall. And then we have an elevation of uh, here, seventy two six seventy two. So it's four feet at this point. Mm -hmm. Uh, this driveway is also not the main driveway to the house, which is up here. It is basically a driveway that gives them access for um, their pool areas back there and such. And they have so one of, one of the things I would be concerned with, with, with some of these walls that 
are really close to the roadway that are uh, that are getting up to six feet. As it as it goes, there's some areas that um, mm -hmm. that this develops up in height, and on, on the next page as well. And um, I I would like the applicant to to look at, and this is just just something to look at as if there's a possibility to step that wall back just a little bit. So the wall doesn't look like it, it appears to be so so much height and maybe that you have two step walls with a with a one foot step back or something that you can get some landscaping so it doesn't give you a tunnel effect. It's just a six foot isn't exactly the tallest wall in the world and we're usually not too worried about six foot. There's been a lot of work and negotiation with that neighbor to get to the point where everyone's satisfied. Okay. The, is the question I ha had, the applicant, is this wall here, what material is it? Is it do you have a it's photo of this? It's going to be a this? dry stack and it's very short. And we've but it's real stone? Yes. It's that would be an example. Here's a, a lot of examples of just dry stack that we've built over the years, and these are. Uh, Giving an example of the El Dorado st uh, stone wall. Uh, you no, know, but you guys are well aware of what that looks like. You see it every day. Yeah, no, it doesn't marry well with this kind of stuff. It's an aesthetic thing. Yes. Okay, I would like to ask you. You mentioned the neighbors. You, if you could let me know what meetings you've had or what information they have. And then also I'd like to know from Tony if this has gotten notice to the neighbors or because it's just right now at the road stage if it hasn't gone to that point yet. A summary of our neighbor negotiations. This owner here um, was someone that did not oppose the project and we've worked with them on some sound attenuation issues some of the landscaping issues for them, the placement and the little dry stack wall in this location and the uh, retaining wall in this location. So this owner owns most of this stretch. This owner across the way did not oppose the project, um, has really had uh, no issues because we're holding the line of the existing paving on this side. So there's no issues with them. This neighbor here was opposing the project hard for years and we still don't really have any cooperation from him but don't really need it um, and then this neighbor I believe is is here she's opposed the project and this neighbor down here has opposed the project um, and then it's kind of spotty um, Bill Mahan looks right here he did not oppose the project um, I believe these people did not oppose the project this person did so it was a little bit of half and half, but that's not unusual in our community. And, and we also had a number of hearings. We had a conceptual hearing with the Planning Commission, then we had formal hearings with the Planning Commission, ABR. We went to City Council. Um, so all of this, including this, was part of the discussion. And uh, the concepts here regarding the road have always been part of the discussion because it's critical. So there's been a lot that, uh, that have seen every step of this as it's progressed. Paul, did you want to cite this on this one? Unfortunately, I did. I was hoping there'd be photographs, so oh, I did I, not. I, I did. You did? Yes. Question for the applicant. Do you have any pictures of this person's house, and in particular the stone wall that's facing this direction? And that's a downhill slope, so if we have any shots this way, you would not. See you wouldn't see the height of the, the, the wall or its way. material? All along this edge of the roadway, there's a grade change falling off, and so the thought, everyone's thought, was let's hold the edge and widen to um, the east. Okay. We need to wrap this one up and move on to the next one. Do we need to have some motion and a comment to move this forward. Yes. I just was wondering if Tony had any answer to the, my question about what we, what we had received. About um, notice. notification? Yeah, I was going to ask receiving that um, construction notice letter from us um, earlier and approved it to be sent to the neighbors 20 days prior to the start of construction. So the noticing letter was already sent into planning and, uh, and approved. 
are you speaking of today's hearing? Mm -hmm. oh. I believe this um, lady may have been noticed. She's a neighbor. Um, we got phone calls from a couple others. Mm -hmm. we, we, we didn't send out a mail notice for this meeting. I would say that it's been through the planning commission whole process of the lot split. So the neighbors who are interested are on the mailing list. And that's something the city has in terms of for projects. The question I wanted to ask the board members is if they were okay with the El Dorado sandstone veneer on a wall in a project of this uh, nature. I'm okay with it. Okay. Strong? Okay. Um, does someone want to make a motion for this project? The one comment that I want to make is that this, pro that the, this discussion today is only about the trees and the road and no removal of any trees not relating to the road is not a part of this discussion. Mr. Chair, I don't want to drag this out any longer, but you may. Um, we didn't talk about the surfacing of the new road. I'm assuming that's, that's AC. It's matching the existing because he's widening the existing road. Have you thought about perhaps enhancing the, the paving at the turnaround area? Uh, no. Yeah. yeah. Enhancing, because it is to fire standards, that's a major issue of the turnaround. If you're uh, speaking of other materials and such, we looked at things and we knew we had to be AC to meet the fire standards right there. I think he means enhanced brick, brick stamped I concrete, mm -hmm. something like that. No. <laughs> no. This is a rural setting and you know, all the homes around us are half acre, acre lots. We're two acre and four acre lots. Um, so we keep it rural. I don't think it uh, needs to be a manicured type of setting for that size of lots. Okay. Any other comments about the tree placement? You want to be more specific on where he locates the trees or you're fine with the groupings? Are you okay with the density that he has proposed? Makes more sense to me. Okay. Comment? Mr. Chair, about the trees, um, they are planning from acorns, but they are removing some trees that are 12 inches in diameter. Is that standard to not replace some with some box trees? We weren't required to. There's a whole lot of discussion about it at all levels. And, and I that would... kind of surprises me. If, if I may interject, I do think that we, we have the opportunity for uh, some of trees that are in larger cans. I don't want to say we went up to boxes, but we have also found in our experience that we do well with trees that come up from the smallest size possible. And uh, we aren't at this point because we're, we're not, the screening is not as necessary as if these houses were going up. So we're looking to get these in as uh, soon as appropriate and start the screen growing right away. And the houses will follow at another time and will come forward to you and that screening will hopefully have already been started and somewhat accomplished. Yes. Yeah, I was thinking about this Yeah, and I would say that those are the discussions that happened before it came to us. So um, you're following your requirements that were presented. Any other, anything else to discuss on this project? And I'd like to uh, craft a motion and see if we can get a first and a second um, that this project is ready for final approval as submitted with the following comments that uh, no uh, oak trees or any trees shall be removed that are not necessary for the construction of the road and that um, the planning commission conditions shall be followed completely and the quality of materials for neighborhood compatibility uh, I'll back out of that one Do you have any photographs of your El Dorado stone walls that you've done in the past? No, but I know you guys know what they look like because they're all over town. Were you were you planning on doing, I mean we really don't have a submittal on the El Dorado stone and um, there are several patterns. You could do coarse, you could do ashlar, you could do five point. What is it that you are proposing? 
that's a valid point. Mm -hmm. Let's, we can go to preliminary approval with coming back to final and consent with additional information about the Would you prefer one wall. we'll take one if you have one in mind? We need to be done with this process and well, move forward. Well, I, I believe that uh, Paul pointed out that you're doing rubble in the front. I would say it needs to be five points. I would just say point. it needs okay. to be five points. Point. Okay. Yeah. So going back to final approval as submitted with the conditions um, that the Retaining wall, sandstone veneer shall be the uh, five-point pattern with the stone cap as drawn. All right. Any other comments? Yes. Did we want to address the request for a person to have a be monitoring the street? I would say that's out of our purview, and that has to do with when they get an encroachment permit and the, and the truck hauling permit through Public Works. That's not design review related. But it's a valid point that's being raised by a neighbor. So we need a first and a second for that motion. First by Gary, second by Bernie. Any other discussion? Final approval as submitted with the following comments. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Can we actually hold on to those with this? Yes. Okay. Yeah, two sets of one. Paul, this is the top of it. We're now on to item two, and we are 10 minutes late, and I apologize. That's okay. We are 2929 Serena Road. Serena Road. Yeah, Serena. And you've been to the staff hearing officer? Yes. And this is a revised proposal for a 368 square foot second story addition and interior remodeling. The existing 1,954 square foot two story single family residence including a 374 square foot attached two car garage is located on a 6,000 square foot lot. The proposed total is 2,322 square feet, has an um, 86 maximum FAR. It says 86 percent. Yeah, this is the 93. I'm not sure. there, was, there were two versions and both were... Uh, Let's start with your name for the record in the microphone. Uh, Chris Belanger. Ready? And yes, this we had two versions, an 86 and a 93, and the board last time, some of the board actually preferred the larger, others were ambivalent, and so the, the 96 was the one that we took to the staff hearing officer and was approved. So you want to go over the modification that she approved? Uh, it was a solar modification uh, where we had... Let's see. Essentially, if you look on page 82.1, this roof here, the flat shed roof and the gable roof, both projected up into the uh, solar access limited area by a fairly small degree. This middle section of the roof did not. It met the requirements. Uh, and so we requested a modification from that uh, limit, which basically just raises the limit up about three feet. Uh, and they looked at it and determined it was uh, reasonable and uh, granted the modification to do so and evaluated that it didn't have a, you know, an impact on the neighbors and so on. Great. Any other changes to the plan since we've looked at them? You no, know, this was really, there were no other requested changes at the last meeting. Overall, the majority of the board seemed to like the design, approve of the design. The question really was whether or not the modification was, was going to be allowed. So with no requested changes, uh, I have not looked at the changes. Okay. <laughs> nice and sweet. Well, let me, um, is that enough for your presentation? Uh, yes. Okay, I will open up um, public comment, seeing nobody in the board, in the room. Are there any letters for this project? 
I will close public comment and bring it back to the board. Are there any questions from board members pertaining to this project? Give us a few seconds to sure. take it in. Do you have a color board, perhaps? Uh, you know, the I, it, everything is match existing, but I did bring just if you wanted to see the the two colors on the house are really the main body color and then the trim and sash color, which are a gray blue and a slightly off white. Okay. So it will be matching existing. Match existing. Yes. Yes. Um, so the new proposal that is, how many square feet is the second story addition in front of us right now, roughly? You know, I would want to, it's been, <laughs> I've gone through so many different times, I almost want to take a look and uh, it should be right here. Right here? Yeah, you'll see it better there. This is building floor two. Mm -hmm. This so, is right. 511, so yeah. yeah. The proposal is incorrect. But... Okay, so... so this is actually for a proposal for a 511 square foot second story addition and a 55 square foot first floor addition. So the total area that he's adding to the structure is 566 square feet. Just FYI, when you turn in plans, make sure that the counter people update what's in the computer if the plans change. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I missed that. It happens all the time. You want to tell them to. <laughs> so the colors are to match existing? That's correct. The same with all of the detail and the trims? That yeah, they... yeah. I put some details in there, but essentially everything is match existing. The intent of the details you see in the set is to match the existing brakes, sockets, window trim. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I have a question. One, one, one person at a time. Uh, what are you proposing for the new garage door? I'm sorry? Is this how the pr proposed elevation is going to look here? Or is there a new oh, door? No. Going? no, that's... Um, I did notice that shows the back of no, the door. No, I'm glad you saw that. That shows no door there, and I'm not sure why that is. Um, there was the carriage door carriage style door that looked like two carriage doors. It was a single roll up there. Um, this with some windows. It was the one that you wanted. <laughs> um, you didn't like the first one. I did a new one and uh, that's what it looks like. I can actually probably pull it up and show you if you would like. Don't worry about it. Okay. We'll, we um, have a copy. We have a copy here. We'll do that real fast. Questions? Yes, we are in questions and comments. Um, any new light fixtures on your exterior light fixtures? There's actually no new light fixtures planned. So this is the only place where there's an existing door, so we just need the fixture. Yeah. Okay. And the front door doesn't change. So. Let's flip through these real fast. Look for the garage door. Yeah, there. That's it. Just double check our set. There we go. Yes. Alrighty. I just noted the uh, March 26th date. So we'll say garage door per March 26th, set up the design drawings. This project is here for preliminary approval, and then the discussion is final can be made at consent. If people agree with that, or whether it should come back to full board for final. Preliminary approval. Preliminary approval. Making neighborhood findings. Making neighborhood findings. Okay. Which are. Get to that page. Uh, just a procedural question. 
It's page 5D. 5D. Right. Consistency in appearance, making the finding neighborhood uh, findings of consistency in appearance, compatibility with the neighborhood, and uh, quality of architecture and materials. Wonderful. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that. Second by Aaron. Uh, comments? Have you done structural drawings? Mm -hmm. You have? We have the structural drawings. They're not in this set, but I have had them done. They don't impact the exterior. I actually talked to the desk, and they said, well, if it doesn't relate to something on the exterior, you needn't include them in this set. So I didn't. They, are, they have been done. Are you ready to go into the building department tomorrow? Uh, not tomorrow, but next week, yes. So we can... I, I'm wondering if we can actually find for final, if, if all of that's been done. That would be great. Discussion? No problem? No problem at all. So then the first and the second have to change their motion. More approval. Making the neighborhood preservation ordinance findings of consistency and appearance, compatibility with the neighborhood, and quality architecture and materials. All right. Is that okay with the seconder? Can I add two things to the comments? Um, that all colors to match the existing and all detailing to match the existing and that the garage door shall be a carriage style as shown in the March 26th drawings. Okay. So you have final today. Let's vote on it first. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Any other additions or corrections to the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's final. I move for denial. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. We learned something today. So we will um, um, take a break and we will read. And we will come back at 5:25 p.m. during the meeting. So you said, um, I don't I don't need them, but I'll recycle them for you, sure. Which this one, just this one. And we're gonna look at item three, which is eight forty SEMA Linda Lane. The project is a proposed 96-square-foot addition to an existing 6,063-square-foot two-story residence with an attached three-car garage. The improvements include a new detached 721-square-foot covered terrace and a new swimming pool and spa. And we have minutes from a previous meeting. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Um, the first comment was the applicant and the arborist to s study alternative solutions to lessen impacts to the large oak tree, i.e. reduce size or redesign or relocate the swimming pool, and number two, to return with detailed landscaping plans. Your name and your presentation. What's your timing? Hi, I'm, I'm Kent Mix and I'm the architect, Bill Spiewak, arborist. Rogers, the landscape architect. Um, uh, as you know, last time we, we were talking about the relationship of the, of the oak to the, or the, the oak and the pool relationship, and actually Bill's, Bill's mitigation plan shows the old relationship of what that pool was currently, or previously proposed, I should say. And so we us three, as well as the client, went back to the site and re-examined pros and cons of various different options, and voila, this is what we have. And Katie, if you want to maybe oh, a little sure. bit more about that. Sorry. So as Kent said, based on your comments and based on site visit, we went out and Bill had the good idea to meet out there at noon. And it was early June, so it was about as high as the sun's going to get. And we realized two things. One, we were closer to the oak than it looks like on paper. 
And two, it was pretty shady, and who wants to swim in the shade? So we started looking at other areas, and this area is really sunny. The other thing we started looking at with the client was, do they really need a cabana, or are they more interested in an outdoor fireplace barbecue area with a pool? And so they decided on the latter. We have the same size pool, 20 by 42, in a north-south orientation. The spa is inside the pool, so the cover will come right over the top of the spa and the stairs. Stone seating area off to one side, which has really pretty views down across the garden. And now you come out a real small terrace. The old plan had a large upper terrace here, but it's on the north side of the building in the shade, and it didn't seem like a place anyone would really want to sit. So we made it small like a landing, down three steps to a little gathering space, a little um, transfer spot, and you come over to the west side to a new terrace with a fireplace, separate barbecue, pool storage area, um, and then the terrace just runs right into the spa. The coping is two foot four so we can get all the equipment lids inside of the coping and we can get the pool cover housing without that little dog ear that's always so unattractive. The turf stays pretty much where it is. I'm just cleaning up the edge. The existing turf sort of wanders in and out, so it'll be a nice lawn panel down in that area. The other thing we discovered is we had previously shown an enclosure for pool equipment in this corner, and there's room in an existing um, equipment enclosure here that serves a, an existing fountain to put the pool equipment there, so we're going to do that. We will be careful about not trenching underneath the oak tree. Um, construction traffic will still come around through this direction into the area of construction. And we will be... I'm going to plant the for this. We will be at the Arbor of Suggestion. Um, yeah, that shows it better. Removing, there's a little turf area down in here underneath the oak trees. We're going to remove that turf. We're going to do native plantings down in there. We will leave the existing four citrus trees that are here, and we will be planting three 15-gallon oak trees, even though we're not removing the oak because we're within the drip line. Uh, it's been asked that we do a mitigation for possible damage to the tree. The planting plan is pretty straightforward. It's a Mediterranean-style house. It's a Mediterranean-style planting palette. There's a big existing canariensis palm here that will remain. There are two ugly cream palms here that the owner loves, and so they're going to remain. There's two more cream palms. You know how I feel about cream palms. Um, and that's basically the gist of it. The existing landscape in the area that's not being worked on is going to be left untouched. And if you want to see... And also we should mention that the, the oak tree from Bill's previous um, uh, kind of mitigation measures and so forth, and with the proposal of the previous pool location, uh, he was doing a lot of pruning to that. Now that we feel that since there's minimal uh, encroachment in, in the critical root zone, that that's going to be minimized quite a bit as well. Um, so we're not proposing to take off the four lens that we we previously previously were. So, but we are still. Bill, you were recommending that we do some thinning and just lightening up of the mass of the tree. Make sure it gets caught. Thanks. Well, since the uh, pool is now moved away from the tree, less pruning will be required. There'll be a little bit of pruning going to the um, west, but it will be smaller branch pruning rather than large limb pruning. And one of my concerns before was with the pool on this side of the tree, over the long term there'd be a lot of limbs coming off that over the course of time. This way it would just be pruning to keep the overhangs back and then a little bit of thinning just for balance. But it's, it's much significantly less than what initially was, would need to be done done. The uh, fencing will go in. So it's the mitigation's the same with planting, um, but the the impacts are far less this way than before. So I think everybody wins. That's what it looks like to me from an arborist perspective. We also have, I don't know if you guys are interested in this, but we have all the 
Since we're here for final, we have full working drawings for uh, layout plan, construction detail reference, details, sections, tell us the paving material is going to be classic oak, Arizona flagstone, which is a real dense flagstone. It doesn't absorb the uh, grease stain so much from children running around with hot dogs and it will it's dense enough to hold it, hold the undercoping track, the screws for the undercoping track for the full cover. And then there's also actual detail fireplace, this uh, uh, structure as well. Fireplace showing dimensions of that. This is the fireplace detail sections. This is the, the terrace, the terrace section through the terrace to show for how the structure is going to be there. Um, and then, thank you. And then the uh, elevations. Obviously, this this is all of the, the elevations that, that are being affected. It's just the, that area that we're adding. This is the back side of the fireplace that's against a hedge there. And then this is the uh, side view where the barbecue is uh, of that little structure. Great. And that's same color it. stucco as the house, same um, tiles tile. on the house there. Thank you. I will now open public comment. Are there, is there anyone from the public wishing to speak on this project? Seeing nobody, staff, are there any letters for this project? No, we haven't received any public comment letters. All right, and I, I will close. The environmental close. assessment is complete, so you can find for preliminary or, or final if you have the information you need. Okay, I'll close public comment and bring it back to the board. Any questions on this project from the board members? Mr. Chair, I have one question. Sure. Um, with the fireplace location and, and a 16-foot chimney, uh, it, what's happening in the neighbor's yard next door near that fireplace? This is a hedge that runs between them right here. There's a, a, a cabana that backs up right against the back of the hedge, actually, mm -hmm. in their pool. And then they have the grass patch lawn is pretty much directly adjacent to the house. We actually went house. over and met yeah. with the neighbors, they're um, clients of mine, we did their pool area some time ago. Mm -hmm. So um, we had planted on their property to block the view of the house, which is two-story, all of trees and some black acacia. So if we removed this edge, you couldn't see through it because they So have there some. is no potential conflict with the chimney. No, we, and we said to them, we're going to put a pool here, and both Mr. and Mrs. Emmons said, well, that's a perfect place because their 18-year-old son has pool parties here all the time. <laughs> Okay. They were more worried about our clients here in the Yeah, good. And their house sits way over here. It's a quarry for person. Okay. Very good. Are there any irrigation um, concerns with the oak and new plantings? There will be a minimal of, or minimum. It should be augmenting what you've got there, right? Yeah, there's, there's existing irrigation all through this area so we'll be modifying it there's minimal new planting to fill in the dirt areas um, this will all be on drip and there's existing turf under the tree at that point Currently. yeah it comes all the way back to here mm -hmm. yeah. Any comments from that end of the table? Relocating the pool, and I think this is ready for final. Bernie? I agree. Okay. Someone would um, entertain a motion? Sure, I'll make that motion. So we're um, going to send this to final, yes? It's a Final approval, um, making the neighborhood preservation ordinance findings of consistency and appearance, compatibility, and quality architecture and material. Okay. And trees. And tree protection. And tree protection. Oh, right. Is there a second for that motion? I'll second. Okay. Any other discussion? Mr. Chair? Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Do we... 
the fireplace, we already talked about the in matching the house. Mm -hmm. Perfect. The style of architecture, okay. yes. Great. And the, the stone hearth and um, caps will be the same flagstone stone as the paper. Okay. Great. Then um, all in favor of the motion? <coughs> Aye. Opposed? And I will abstain from this one just because I, I missed the meeting in between. Oh. No comment. I mean, that's no other reason than that. Not to be honest. I saw it at consent. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that was long. I know, you've changed it a lot since then. It's changed like numerous times since then. Thank you. She's got that one. You only need one, right? Next will be item four, and we're going to wait five minutes because we don't start things until it's 15 minutes early, so you can get set, but um, I'm going to take a five-minute recess. Five fifty right now. The project is 321 El Monte Drive. The proposal is for a one- and two-story additions of a 1,125 square feet and remodeling of an existing one-story, 1,765 square foot single-family residence with an attached two-car, 400 square foot garage. The total floor area of 2,773 square feet on an 8,276 square foot lot is slightly less than 85% of the maximum FAR. Comments only project requires coastal review. So if we can have your, your name for the record in the presentation. All right. Hi, I'm Julie Banks. I'm the applicant for the project. Uh, Gene Vernon, owner of Milk. Time out. Sorry. Okay. Uh, what we're presenting is a, an addition, a second story addition, as well as the uh, designated square footage um, that was mentioned in this. So let me, well, I'll reference this. We've got um, the existing square footage total for the house right now is um, grossed. 1765 and 1847 with a 400 square foot garage, a Natten 439. What we're proposing to add is um, an addition to the first floor of 340 square feet and to the second floor of 785 square feet. Okay. Uh, we'll also be demolishing 517 feet of the existing residence. Um, there will be, there's an existing patio and gazebo now on the property which will be uh, demolished and then in in place of that there will be a 750 square foot patio on the uh, east elevation uh, let's see the garage will be the same size it's not changing just renovating do you want to go over a site plan and then compare it with some some photographs okay and then huh. what we've done is the rear yard setback, um, the existing building was encroaching into that. What we've done is we've pushed it back an additional six feet, so it's actually six feet beyond the 20-foot setback, so it's well within the requirements for that. All the other setbacks are met um, easily, front and in interior yards. The open yard area is, within, is in conformance. We've got it at 1,300 square feet. Um, we'll have, you know, as far as our, the uh, landscaping goes, we're going to do drought tolerant, you know, low water required plantings uh, to make the yard look very nice. Add a couple of palms in front. There is an existing tree. The uh, existing house is, this is the, the front elevation, which is actually east facing south and north. Um, right now the house is just a one-story kind of nondescript piece of uh, property and it's uh, what we're looking to do is just enhance it, raise up the, the uh, to the second floor, uh, create a, a beautiful building that's going to enhance the neighborhood and keeping with the Santa Barbara style we'll have the clay tile roof and the uh, cement uh, uh, off-white cement uh, plaster siding, um, some interesting balcony features, some corbels, wood beams, wood doors, and the, um, so you can see it will de definitely enhance that. The views around the neighborhoods, there are two-story uh, buildings in existence. You can see these on the photos. This is an example of a building that would be similar to what we're proposing that's down the street. Okay. Uh, Let's look at the elevations of your project. Right. Here are all the elevations. 
So is this the front? This is the street um, elevation. What's here is the existing garage. Uh, there will be a balcony that comes up off of the office, uh, which you can see in this elevation. There's a parapet wall there. Um, there's a tower element, which gives some interest, and that's where this office area is. We're also showing the uh, shed roof here. We've got some corbels or uh, possibly uh, faux rafters uh, at this um, cantilevered area around here, around the master suite. Um, hey, let's see. If this is the front elevation, is the front door seen? From the front door is actually seen from the side. Yeah, courtyard. in the courtyard, and we okay. don't have an interior elevation of that. Okay. But it would be, you know, in through here. Um, other features would be this, you know, this nice uh, deck that we show back there. And, this is uh, the back elevation. Yeah. We've got our, um, you know, some interesting uh, architectural features trying to uh, keep in, in keeping with this style, the sort of Spanish colonial Santa Barbara style. Okay. Let's quickly go through the first and second floor plan and then we'll go there. Site plan. Just Here's go the over the, the yeah exactly the entrances and exterior living spaces. Okay, this is the courtyard we referenced. Okay, so there is the front door. Right, the front door. Here's the garage, and of okay. course that would be the driveway. Uh, the access to the rear patio area, and then these are um, all exits to. Okay. This is to the side yard in this little courtyard area. There's a built-up planter here. Um, what else have we got? As far as first floor, this is a, a storage thing in the back. Um, on the second floor, we've got access to the deck through here. Another small deck that's in between the master suite and the second bath. There's a single door going out onto that deck. And then um, double doors out onto the deck from the master suite, which you saw in that front elevation you can see the side of it so this dotted line right here is actually this deck right here mm -hmm. and then the it continues around the, the uh, cantilevered section of Can the second floor and then this staircase actually turns and curves that way mm -hmm. oh thank you I didn't catch that good anything else well we just think it's a wonderful enhancement to the neighborhood okay. um, and I think that we've uh, followed what we perceive to be Santa Barbara's requirements to achieve well, we that. tried to make changes that would be uh, bring the backyard into conformance and keep in conformance with all the uh, bars in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. okay. All righty. Um, I will now open a public comment. This project is item four, which is 321 El Monte Drive. We started it early. Are there any speakers for this project? We need to have you fill out a speak. Perfect. I don't have any speaker slips. Now I do. Okay. Um, Mr. Steve Tapper, you come on up to this chair and you approach the board and tell us your thoughts. We'd like to hear from you. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, my name is Steve Tepper. I live at 325 El Monte Drive, which is next door to the... On the proposed, uphill side? On or the uphill side. side. Okay. Um, I am concerned uh, mainly with the uh, second story addition, which runs along the uh, my side of, of, of the uh, project. Um, with the decks and the windows there, I will lose all of my privacy in two of my bedrooms and my backyard. Um, it's a great concern of mine uh, <laughs> that uh, we've lived there for 12 years, and uh, when we bought the house, we you know, have a little bit of ocean view from both bedrooms, which you know I realize that we may lose those. But my main concern is the privacy. Um, the way that the lots are situated, uh, our house sits a little bit higher than theirs, and with the proposed bedrooms that run along that size and the deck and everything, they will be looking right into our bedrooms. Um, Excuse me, guys. I'm listening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the fact that they're bringing this whole house forward as well, it just, you know, we're just going to be looking at a whole wall 
fail, and, and, and to me, it's just not very conducive. Um, you know, we've had to put up with, you know, the, the people living there for a few years and all the uh, odds and ends that have gone on. I, I did send an email. I don't know if you have a copy of that. Thank you. We actually did get the email, so, so thank you. Those are my concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's some other speakers. If you um, hand me your speaker slip. This is Don Hansen. Um, I actually wanted to see the design of the second story deck on my side because it looks like it's changed from the last time I looked at it. Actually, can you announce your name for the record even though I read Don it? Hansen, 315 El Monte. And you're on the ocean side of the project? Downhill side. Downhill side, okay. Oh, okay. When you, yeah, when you point, if you can point to this one, that'd be great. You wanted the second floor facing. Oops. This is facing my side. Okay, and it looks like it's it's changed from the last time I saw it. So this wall used to be. We need. Okay, we're talking about these drawings that we have today, and I'm sorry that it might have changed. So where is that deck on here? What am I looking at? There is a deck that's right here that's over the garage. Okay. And how far out does it extend? This um, one? Let me get the site. It doesn't really show there, but it's about half. This is your home right here? Mm-hmm. Okay. And you have two windows right here? And your, is your garage? This Our garage. This way. Your garage comes in there and these, okay. So in the elevation, there seems to be a deck that's right along this side. Okay, and if you look at those pictures I've shown up in my concern in my backyard, you can see the home now and where that's going to give them a view directly into our yard. Okay, well, we'll talk about that. Okay. Thank you for coming. Right. I just saw someone walk in. We're reviewing... Project um, item six, which is 321 El Monte Drive, we started a little early. Okay. Is there any other speakers for this project? Item four, I'm sorry, 321 El Monte Drive. If there are no other public speakers, I'll... Staff, are there any letters? Okay, I received an additional email uh, from Mr. John Kerman. He says he appreciates the efforts to minimize the second story windows on the west facing elevation into his backyard although there seem to be significant view and privacy concerns for the neighbors to the immediate north and south. And Mr. Kerman has concerns about the size of the south-facing deck on the west side of the house. The deck is quite large and appears as though it has the potential to be even larger. The intended use of this deck is unclear as it is accessed through the proposed second-story office. I would like to see a smaller deck that is recessed from the west side of the house to protect existing backyard privacy for my house. That was John Kerman. Thank you. And with that, I'll close public comment and bring it back to the board for questions. Any questions for the board members regarding this project? Mr. Chair? Yes. Did you have any drawings of what that courtyard is going to uh, look like? You have a, apparently you have six foot fence or six foot wall that's going in front. And Just again, what we have in here now. There's no elevation. No, and it's, it isn't intended to be six feet. And it uh, intended to have a lot of wrought iron so that you see in and out of the courtyard. And you have no uh, drawings of that though, right? Not at this point. And, and uh, if I can address it, I hear a lot of concerns about... Not yet. Actually, um, <laughs> we're in, in questions from the board members. Mr. Chair. Yes, Denise. I've been having a little difficulty 
difficulty that since the the deck on the south side isn't really dotted in that I can tell on the site plan it's very difficult to see how, you know exactly how that impacts the neighbor but I mean it's set in from the edge of the garage I know um, so I suppose it is 15 feet back the dimension of the um, on the floor plan shows how deep that well, what we're not getting is the, the distance from the property line anywhere. There's nowhere where it shows the distance of the property line. Yeah, that's, the, that's yeah. what I'm having What I can explain today. to you is what we like to see, which helps us in the review process. If we look at the front elevation, your property line is right here somewhere. No, and it's some distance, your house. Well, from the property line to where the deck is is another distance, and we like to know this distance. Our guideline is 15 feet so that you don't intrude on your neighbor, and it's something we're concerned about, we address. So at this point, we understand what the neighbor is trying to say, and we need some additional information from you in order for us to determine if that's going to be an impact. So it's an Any other questions from board members? Okay, no, take your time. Um, if we can go into comments, segue into that. Mr. Glenn, should I tap you first? Um, well, I'm sure the, the one of the largest issues that we're going to be talking about is, is this deck here. Um, and one is this, the pure size of it is a question as to does it really need to be that big? And if it doesn't need to be that big, is there a better place for it to be if it gets smaller? And I, that's how I kind of would, would like to look at this project. The, the other part of that deck is how it looks in elevation. And in this style of architecture, if you look at the elevation, there's a very small little roof projection on this side and the same projection basically is shown for almost half of the garage so in looking at it it looks like that's a flat roof up there and it doesn't make sense to do it that way you know, it wouldn't have ever been done that way unless it was all deck so it, it seems like it wants to have a taller a taller roof so the roof has a chance to, to grow and, and potentially even shield it from the view from either the road or the neighbor or wherever it makes the best sense to put this deck. Um, and there's some other just aesthetic comments about on the north elevation, you know, there's this large plaster mass here that we're building on top of these little tiny spindly columns and it just doesn't look right. So those can be all thickened up into masses very easily and it will help make this project be a lot better. Um, the third comment had to do with this little tower element, which reads as a tower kind of in plan. And on maybe one side it does here and on the other side. But it's sort of a strange integration that it's flush with this wall. And this roof is framed to make it look like a, a square room. But it's really just a continuation of this wall. And that could be handled a lot of ways by either just taking the tower out and, and, and creating a bump there. And that would read a lot better. That may be complicating because this is all cantilevered off already. So there's a, a couple things there. Um, there's also some elements that are just feeling awkward. These very large windows that close to the corner in a plaster building would have never happened. Thank you. Yes, Denise. In measuring uh, between the two plans to the north and south decks, it looks like they are not set back 15 feet from the property line, which is one of our requirements for the decks and being neighborhood friendly. Okay. Yes. You may go. Handful of comments. Um, there's there's several things that I've noticed with this plan. One thing, uh, it's very deck driven. There's lots of decks and they're very massive. There's lots of cantilevers on the building, both sides. There's no entry presence at all to the building. Uh, and you haven't portrayed that because you didn't 
draw the courtyard. Mm -hmm. So we, we really, as, it, as we're looking at the east elevation, we don't even know how to get into the house. Secondly, and I think most importantly, is I'm not quite convinced that this is neighborhood compatible. I think the amount of second story element is, is excessive and um, I think that this is not a good example of the neighborhood of, of what um, what this particular neighborhood is asking for. And I think that the um, the amount of building, the second story building with cantilevers and sizes and relentless roof line and um, this, uh, this deck that goes from one side of the building to the next, um, I just think it's a very aggressive uh, design. And personally, I would like to see it downsize. Thank you. Bernie or Aaron? with all points made thus far. I guess the one thing that wasn't mentioned is this on the north and south elevation, I know it's just a really straight roof line and that could be broken up. That's really my only comment. That's fine. Thank you. Bernie. Mr. Chair, I agree with what everybody said. So I'll be finished. Okay. Thank you. Um, I happen to notice one item. You mentioned clay roof tile, which is great. It says S tile roof. We actually prefer to see a two piece mission tile when it's new construction, unless it's existing conditions that don't allow it structurally. But when it's new construction, it's a more preferable to go with a two piece. That's a minor point. Um, the comments basically made by the board is to go back and to work on the design elements as well as the cantilevers and the decks. So um, you're taking some notes and I'll sum this up and, and we'll entertain a motion to uh, return back to the full board with the revised design solution for this project. Um, the comments. I should actually go. Do you understand the decks and the comments that we were asking for? Okay. So that pertained to the one that was on the south as, as well as, I guess, these in the north and the, and the south elevations, whatever. So that's okay. Um, make a motion for indefinite continuance back to full board with the following comments that the applicant to redesign the decks on the west and north elevation to comply with the um, neighborhood guidelines of being uh, suggested 15 feet set back from the property line and that the applicant redesign the deck on the south elevation or to provide information that is um, complying with the ordinance. Some members of the board feel that the deck is excessive in size and there is concern that the roof be at um, the applicant should uh, should study should redesign the roof element at the garage as it adjacent to the deck. Um, we'll, we'll do comments in a moment. Applicant should um, redesign the cantilevers so that they're not excessive in nature and be balanced, proportional. There was a comment about decks on both sides as well as on the three, so design for that. Applicants should study the tower element and make it more tower-like. Um, applicant to continue refining the details, the architectural detailing, and to bring examples of further study. Applicant to provide all exterior elevations, including the courtyard, for, so that we can further understand the project. Um, it is suggested to the applicant to reduce the second floor is that it appears too boxy and too large in scale. And it is suggested that the applicant vary the roof lines on the second floor to add some more articulation, some variety. And as a drafting comment, if you can provide on the site, on the floor plan, the location of the property lines so that we can see the proximity both on the first floor and on the second floor so they can be determined the windows we really didn't study these windows in relationship to the second floor I mean 
second floor windows to the property line, but it'd be important to show those property lines. And with that, um, any other d comments? Uh, your very first uh, uh, comment what, uh, needed to also include the, the south uh, deck. The south deck. Okay. The applica applicant to restudy the south, east, and west decks. South, east, and west. And north. There's one over here, too. All decks. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, would the uh, chair... Uh, oh, it's not my motion. Somebody needs to set would, first and second. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if we could get a straw vote on the size, bulk, and scale of this, how the uh, rest of the board feels about that. A uh, straw vote on the size of the design as we see today um, is thinking that the square footage that's being added, let's go over and preface it this way. The second floor is a 785 square foot addition and the first floor is 340 square foot. So looking at the elevations and seeing that it's about a thousand square foot addition to an existing house for a total of 2,700 square feet. Is the project too big, bulk mass and scale as a straw vote for the board members, the way it appears? Is the project too big, the way as it appears? The way, it, I, I believe that the project is too big. The way it appears, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, it's six to zero that the, the bulk mass and scale is too large for the way it appears. Um, there's some design work that can happen, some tricks, and I hate to use the word tricks, but design embellishments that can be to make the building. Mr. Chair, I just want to, the bulk mass and scale is how it appears. I think the square footage is probably fine. You, you can reduce decks and you can change roof lines and it'll appear much lower and still have the same square footage. That's the key thing to hear. Yeah, that is an important thing to hear because I'm not against the square footage. Thank you. So with that motion, we need a first and a second and any additional comments. First by Aaron. By Denise. Any additional comments? All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? and continued indefinitely. Back to full board. Save that so you can have that one back. Thank you. And these folks. The next item is uh, 3050 Sea Cliff, and it's supposed to start in 20 minutes, so we're ahead of schedule. So we're going to take another break. We'll start this one at 6:30, which is in 10 minutes. So we're going to take a 10-minute break. <laughs> Item five, which is 3050 Sea Cliff. The project will be heard in two phases. The first phase will be a site concept review to discuss the site um, placement of the home. It's going to be a uh, demolition and a rebuild. The proposed is to demolish an existing 1,879 square foot single family home and garage and construct an 8,228 square foot two story single family residence with a full basement including 516 square, f square foot two, two car garage. The proposal includes a new swimming pool and 1,330 cubic yards of cut, of which 650 cubic yards of fill and 650 cubic yards of export. The project is located on a 1.2 acre lot in the coastal zone requiring a coastal exclusion permit. Um, excluding the 3,025 square foot basement, the proposed total of 5,203 square feet is 102 percent of the maximum guideline FAR. Because the lot size is greater than 15,000 square feet, the uh, FAR are guidelines. 
So if we can have your name and presentation, and let's discuss the site placement. Okay. I'm Brian Cornell, and Mark and Kathy Zarati, the property owners, are here. Chris Temple, Landscape Architect. Architect? <laughs> Trish Allen, general troublemaker. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is a, a pretty extraordinary site. You all have been looking at this, so you can see that it's on it's on the cliff, basically right above um, Cliff Drive. So when probably the best vantage point from here that you can see is looking up from Hendry's at the at the leading edge of this property. So it's really it is not um, visible from a public standpoint really from any places these are obviously attempts to see that you can see the edge of it the existing house um, this is at least one shot of it so you can see and you can see from the site plan that the existing house is pushed very close to the cliff it's a one-story um, house and obviously the views are extraordinary from this location there's a couple of shots looking out you really can't you can just barely see, you know, from when you're standing at the edge of the cliff, you can barely see the sand at Henry's Beach. It's mostly that, that long view, obviously, looking out. Um, the neighborhood, I think it's worthy of seeing. There was a, a wall that was built here um, probably, I don't know, five or six years ago the wall was built. At least. Um, so here on this photo, which is taken from, sorry, I got turned around from the street here, you can see the, uh, the, this neighbor's home. So that's that two-story home right here. Um, that's a shot of the wall. This is a view looking at the gate, the existing gate. It's right here at the end of this cul-de-sac. Um, and then just continuing around that cul-de-sac to kind of give you a sense of, of the adjoining neighborhood that's looking straight down in, at the end of the cul-de-sac. And then this view is looking down this little private drive here. Um, the site is basically, you know, this is actually a, a shot in the middle of the property. So this is the existing house and that's the neighboring house. You can see it's for all practical purposes. It is a, a flat site. That's kind of a shot of the, of the adjoining neighbor, that house. That's correct. That's that little storage shed right here. And that is, gives you a good shot uh, besides of surge the edge of the cliff or the bluffs and um, the existing house. So you can see again how close the house is to that edge of cliff. So um, really are in, in looking at this, um, Mark and Kathy I think understood right off the, the FAR guideline and wanted to follow that really in, in spirit. Um, their, their program for this house was um, was larger than that and so that is why we decided early on to go with a basement structure which is entirely subterranean and I guess if, if this is my initial site plan here which I can show you in more detail we basically decided to move the house back to a point where we were not affecting the natural flow of uh, drainage on the site today and pretty much put it at that crown point um, and moved it obviously away from the edge of the of the um, cliff. So that is the site placement, and I can give you obviously we can look at probably be better to next if you want to share look at the landscape plan, and we can kind of talk about the site plan in more detail. Sure. Since that's much more attractive than that plan. How, do you want some copies down there? Do you think? Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, you get the non colored version, Gary. Um, can you go ahead? Sure. Basically, what we did here is we came in and we needed to widen the existing driveway to meet the fire department requirements. So we did widen that driveway. You can see the line of the existing drive to 16 feet. So we'll come in with a new column and walls on that side. And the existing drive goes up the side of the property line right now. So we're obviously getting rid of that. And we're coming around here 
to the, the front entry of the home. And what we want to use is uh, more of a permeable type paving. So we're going to use the Cherokee Creek cobblestone pavers for the entry drive, stone for the entry, and carry that theme all the way over here to the service area at the garage. We are coming in with a um, little pedestrian access there and guest parking turnaround type parking space here, which will just be decomposed granite. Um, we would like to, there's an existing maiden tree here that is just beautiful. It's really large. So we're going to relocate that and use that at the front of the house probably. And our theme's French country, so we have some areas that are very informal and some that are maybe a little more formal, but we're tying into that French country theme of the style of the, the architecture. We have a little pond area, sitting area here as a focal point. Um, coming through to the garden, different garden areas, this is the rear of the house with stone paving, we're using that. Um, new entertainment area, outdoor barbecue and fireplace seat wall and terrace area. This will be a nice big freeform pool with a vanishing edge that will drop down only a couple feet to a little basin and sitting area down below. Actually the existing home sits right here so we're not going past where the development is. That's the existing um, back patio and walkway so we didn't go past that. And then just stepping down and working with the grade to a little seating area and a little Belvedere overlook wall there. Um, Below the pool, we want to do, a, right now they've got bougainvillea and a lot of non-natives down there, so we want to clean that all up and just use native, drought-tolerant plant material on this slope area. This edge right here is where the bougainvillea, in fact, that's the outline of the existing bougainvillea. Mm -hmm. So we want to clean that up and um, just use native plant material in that area. This is the turf. We have stone steppers um, going through turf. We tried to minimize the hardscape, doing the same theme around the pool area. So we have the stone terrace areas and then where we can use the pavers and turf area to make that a little um, more natural and soft and permeable is what we're trying to achieve there. And although it doesn't show on this, we're basically planning on these, this area and, and both of the side yards to essentially be the, the lower spots on the site to, to serve as, as detention mm -hmm. areas. For the water runoff. And so the theme really, the intent too, is to screen the neighbors on the sides of the property. So the trees that we'd like to use are the mate and the magnolia, the red Red leaf plum for accent, birch trees, especially in the low-lying areas, some citrus, and then provide that perimeter screening between the properties, but also keeping the plant material and trees out of the area where we have the views of the neighbors. So we're trying to accommodate those views. I guess it's on this side here. Thank you. We have um, we have worked really closely with these two neighbors. In fact, Trish has gone around and, and canvassed uh, a lot of the neighborhood, and she can probably tell you about that. But I I will tell you that um, this neighbor has is, is been very cooperative and is very pleased, obviously, that we're relocating the house from this location um, to here. Um, the Shots, who live in this house here, this house was probably constructed just three or so years ago. Um, we've we've really tried to keep as keep the smaller portion of the house away from them because they're a little lower than us. So um, that's been a major focus of our, our effort here. Both of those neighbors have submitted letters of support. They've both seen the plans. Okay. I don't know if you want me to go into the architecture nope, now. Nope, not at all. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Okay. I'm going to open up uh, public comment for the site review of this project. Are there any letters or any speaker slips? Well, I guess I can go ahead and uh, acknowledge the, the letters that we do have, although they're not specifically addressing only the site. But let's go ahead and do that. Okay. Let's see. We got an email from Robert and Laura Lyon at 3056 Braemar. Uh, they're voicing their concerns over the demolition and construction of the new residence strongly oppose the size of the new structure. The fact that it is to be a two-story exceeds the uh, FARs and concerned about the amount of grading, cut and fill. Um, I do not want to see a project of this size approved as it would set a precedent for future developments. And let's see, we got another letter from David and Connie Schott and they say they fully support this new home. And a letter from Jim and Joy Blake. Yeah, uh, let's see. We own the property on the west side, directly next door to the Zorati project. Would like to advise 
all interested and or concerned parties that we have no objections or questions regarding the Zorati plans. Thank you. With that, I, oops, you may, you, you're very close. <laughs> Why don't you come on down into this chair and you can fill out the speaker slip in a moment. If you can make your comments only about the site placement. We'll later talk about the architecture, but we just want to talk about the site placement. Good. I'm Bill Spraker. I live at 37 to Cliff. And where approximately would this be? If this to is the west, uh, the right. next house over. The next one here? Right. Okay, perfect. Right. And uh, our concern, this looks like a great project, by the way. It's the first I've seen. A little closer to the mic. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, looks beautiful. Uh, our concern is the size. Uh, it seems pretty big, and I, I wasn't sure in the notice we received why the basement wasn't included as part of the, the living space. That, the, know, the answer for that is that in design review, we look at the aesthetics of the structure, and if it's completely buried, it could be four stories below grade, and it still looks the same from up above. Okay. It's We look at the visual aspect from the outside, and there's certain things if it's 50% exposed or whatever. So that's why the basement was not included in those calculations. Okay. The uh, other concern was uh, all the grading and things, and it seems with the house being moved back, that's going to, because those, those bluffs are kind of unstable, you know, they, uh, with that much weight and all the digging and stuff, we were concerned about that. And then the other thing was uh, we didn't want to lose any of our view, too. We look across this house and, and have a view there, too, and it seems like it's set back far enough now, and we've thought about not putting landscaping in the way of, of cutting down our view, because we can kind of see towards uh, uh, Douglas, uh, Douglas Preserve Park, the other bluff across from the beach there. Um, actually, we need to look at us. Yeah. Yeah. So his parcel is this parcel. Okay. And basically ours. On the other this side of the blades, is that right? Excuse yeah, me, right, excuse me. Exactly. So we understand anything else? <laughs> no, that's it. I, I just wanted to, you know, just to express that concern no, and uh, it's good. see what's up. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So going back to the question, which parcel is his parcel? And which is your site? Our site is this site right here. And he's two over. He's this person. Okay, so he's this person's site. And with that, seeing no other people, I will close public comment and bring it back to the board for questions. Mr. Chair. Yes, Glenn. Um, Two questions. I thought in your presentation you mentioned guest parking over here. And the question is, in looking at one of the other plans, the, the front yard setback, and if that guest parking was allowed in that front yard setback. Actually, if we can have either the architect or Trish talk about the setbacks. I looked at the plans earlier. Mr. Chair. Oops, maybe Tony will. Tony. This, this site's a little bit odd in terms of the zoning restrictions because it's the front yard technically is on Cliff Drive, so they have the front setback on Cliff Drive. And Sea uh, Cliff is not a street, so it doesn't have a front setback. So it's all interior setbacks. It's a private road on what appears as the frontage. So the, the front setback does not apply to that property line. And I'd have to look at the site plan to see where the interior yard. Well, yeah. here, yeah, here yeah, it is. You can see it here. Unfortunately, that isn't showing the uh, that that parking. But this would be this this area would be within that fifteen foot within zone. That fifteen foot zone. It's really for turning. So, and I should explain. Yeah. yeah, that this. I mean, that. Yeah, that isn't critical as far as parking. One of the things that Chris didn't mention that we think is very important here is this wall you noticed in these photographs that I showed you. That wall is a rather imposing feature right now on um, on the street. It'll be the last photo I find, I'm sure. So that's, there it is. So what we want to do is we want to cut a, a pedestrian gate into that wall about in this location so that, you know, it, that, that people do have access from the street to the front door via that gate. Question for you, does this wall have a permit? That wall is permitted, yes. Brian, is the, is this, I'm not sure if this might be for staff, question for staff. 
is the setback from the property line, or is it from no, the right-of-way? No, it would be from the right-of-way, right yeah. yeah. Even though the property I goes to the center line of the street. The, the, second, the second question I had um, referred to the, the pool fencing as to what type of fencing may be showing up here? Well, we're, we've got, of course, this wall in front, and we're working with both of our neighbors to construct a new fence that will go along the properties, the property line. And then what our intent is, is there, there actually is some remnants of, of chain link in here, but our desire is to have essentially a, a fence that gets integrated into the into the planting at the top of the of the bank here so that it just eventually gets overgrown and, and disappears and that would be the final leg of that of the pool fencing. It's basically replacing the fencing where it is right now so it's down the slope a little bit. So on the side so, the sides you're working right now with each neighbor yeah. to reconstruct yeah. construct or to construct a new a new fence on both both property lines. And then we're returning the fence and with the little garden gate and whatnot and st stone or stucco walls on both sides of the house. So you can actually see there's a chain link fence now that's going on down. That's that that is approximately in this area right mm -hmm. here. And then again there's a fence that's running through this Bogan Via currently. Okay. Any other questions from board members? Mr. And I, I'm not seeing any retaining walls, and I know that there's a, there's a fair amount of grading on this project. And well, I know it's, that it's all the basement, really. Basement is where, the is where the grading is. Yeah, there's really no. We're we're really the the only alteration to the site is is our hope that we can use some of the spoils from the basement, you know, and and spread it out on the site here so that we don't have to truck it all away. That was my question, actually, Gary, because it did talk about 650 that was going to be um, fill and 650 that was export. Mm -hmm. So I wanted you to sort of explain how that worked. Yeah, so I think obviously there's limits to how high we want to raise this, both from our neighbor's standpoint and just from a practical standpoint. So in order to avoid retaining walls at the at the perimeters, that we're, we're using what fill we can from the excavation of the basement to, to basically spread around the site but maintaining the existing drainage system and then what we can't reuse will have to export. Do you have a conceptual idea of how much uh, how much height you're going to gain on that? It is at this point I think it's about 18 inches above the natural grade you know maybe two feet but that's you know that's really again inconsequential from a dirt standpoint because of course it's we're going to build the raised foundation over the over the basement and so that you know that finished floor will just come up and then we'll basically taper the, the soil to it. Any more discussions about the site? If not, let's have a straw poll about the design for the uh, location that the house is on the site plan. All in favor of the design as presented? And opposed? Four? I'm abstaining. abstaining? Uh, what do you want more? Of course, I, I still would have questions. Uh, uh, if if the site, in fact, if the the first floor, in fact, will be raised at a two foot level, and I don't know how big, how tall the house is going to get, I don't know if I could be in favor of raising that grade um, two feet. So that's why I would be standoffish about it. Okay. So with that, there's this motion of four to. Zero to two abstain, or you want to be a no vote? I'm going to go. I'm going to go no. No. Yeah. So four one one, the motion four, one, one. carries. And now let's talk about architecture. <clears throat> okay. So as Chris already alluded to, um, Mark and Kathy um, love uh, the look of a of, of French provincial, and so that is the style that we have chosen here. Now these are obviously uh, computer renderings without trees, but the, the desire here is to create a home that is, is um, very authentic from the standpoint of detailing. So the roofs will be slate. 
the coppers will be gutter. I mean, maybe the, the gutters will be copper. The plaster will be a, a darker tone. I think that we have some uh, paint chips to kind of look at relative to that. You can see where we're proposing the, um, to have native sandstone veneer on portions of the house. So we're looking at, you know, a color palette like this. And obviously, in in looking at a at this style. Um, the nature of this style is requires steep roofs. It doesn't work well if the roofs are not uh, at really as steep as possible. And I'll tell you that we have actually struggled in terms of in terms of this particular style. And Levita, maybe that one photo, that that one image that you were we were looking at would be a good one. Um, in terms of this style, we really would would ideally have a slightly steeper roof pitch. So this is the kind of this is the kind of detailing and the look in terms of I think the color of the plaster, the slate, the copper gutters um, that we are looking for. And you can see on a, on on this particular example, it's a very steep roof pitch. So recognizing the 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 height limits that we have, we've taken the 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 peak of the roof to that maximum and essentially the second floor then is gets built into that roof which is again very indicative of of this kind of style um, we think that the, the the Santa Barbara sandstone really will help ground this house into the site it's a very important feature and again the darker tone of plaster is going to be very important also to settle the home the natural green slate um, as well um, will do a lot to make it settle in. So in terms of even though we're coming to the maximum height, you can see that that really is the result of, of, the, of the steeper roof pitches. The, the little uh, uh, rotunda element is just peeking over that as an architectural expression and that obviously is a, is a function of getting the proper proportion out of, out of that one piece. Um, I had mentioned before from the from the eastern side we have one story element um, and and tried to keep that as far away from the shots as possible so that's been important to have that one story portion and then the portions of the house that are two story again are typically tucked into um, that roof pitch form and so this is the you can see the view from the in, as you enter the site what the massing of the house is going to look like we felt that it also really helped to disconnect the garage and make it a little freestanding structure so as to reduce any apparent mass of, of the house as much as possible so that's the basic theme you know you can see again the veranda at this one story element so this is the view from basically the the eastern edge of of the bluff and this is looking from the from the other side great and we did do a little photo sim superimposed on that image uh, with the wall so you can see how the house you know peaks up from at least the streets vantage point and from all of the, the public uh, vantage points the house is set back far enough from the bluff to where it's really not going to be visible. And here you can see the, the relative massing. You want to go quickly go over like the first floor exterior living spaces and the second floor any balconies or decks that relate to exterior living. We have, um, and I'll, I'll roll back and forth between the elevations and the plan. Um, on the on the uh, south side, we have these deep, two deep veranda elements to provide adequate sun uh, control into the family room and the living room. And of course, you saw in Chris's plan how that it expands out into the um, yard area. We have a little stair that comes up from the backyard, uh, and we've we've basically buried a deck back into the middle of the house, which also helps to break the massing up, so that when you're when you're looking at the house, you have the one-story element of the living room with its veranda, and then this this is basically a flat a flat portion. Um, before you get into the mass at the at the second floor, and at the second floor, besides that little 
deck area that is over the kitchen area, there is a deck off of the master, which is really the roof of that veranda that's off the family room. You might notice here, on, these are my set, this, this arch is a little bit tight and it needs to be pulled down. It's a little thin above, so we need to, we need to refine that. Can you go back to any more decks or balconies on the second floor we should be aware of? Uh, no, we haven't put anything on that western side at all. It's just at the at the master and that... Um, and this is the front door of the entry? Yes. And service entry. Yeah, and that, so that's connected to the, to the detached garage. Will there be a pergola or any kind of structure between the two? Well, we did talk about doing a little, a little uh, like a grape arbor or some kind of a of a little light, probably even even one that is wrought iron um, connection. Like a little dip. Is that a balcony? Well, it does look like a little balcony, and that is um, off the master. Yeah, that is off the master, that, but it's small. But I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, there it is. Mm -hmm. If that's all for your presentation, I'll um, be happy to answer questions. Certainly. Well, we'll go to public comment first. Any public comment regarding this project? Anything about the architecture? All right, staff. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a question, Brian. You mentioned that the fill, some of the pool mm -hmm. grading would be fill on site. Mm -hmm. And my question is about the maximum building height, if you measured that down to natural grade. Because building height yeah, is we defined are assuming, to the yes, lower of natural or finished grade. We're assuming that that maximum is to the existing grade. To the existing grade, yes. Before, before the fill. Before the fill. Okay. That's what we understand we'll have to measure to. Okay. Yes. And by the way, I think that, the, you know, the in, obviously as we looked at on the grading plan, um, the, there, the only reason that we wanted to place some fill in here really is to, is to alleviate having to export it all. I mean, if, we, if, if it was your desire, obviously we could, but it makes, it makes sense. And given the natural drainage of the site where this is kind of the high point now, you know, it makes sense to lose some of that um, in this area, but it's it's not a it's not a necessity. It seemed like a reasonable amount to get rid of some of that um, some Good of enough. that soil. Any other comments from staff? Then I'll close public comment and return it back to full board for questions. Questions from board members. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I've noticed some discrepancies between the landscape plan and, and, and the architectural plan, specifically about these columns mm -hmm. that are supporting this outdoor mm -hmm. deck areas. Um, Chris was just working from a earlier, an earlier version where we did have those additional columns. Okay. Because my other, my other comment before I saw the landscape plan was this felt very large and, and kind of out of scale with some of the other elements on, on the building. It seemed like it wanted to be divided up into multiple mm -hmm. arches, which is probably where it was before based on that landscape plan. That's right. So that was my one comment there. Um, the garage seems... We're into questions, by the way. Okay. I'm sorry. So <laughs> Spare you the comments for a while. Any other questions? Okay, Mr. Question? Question. Okay. At 30 feet, do you feel that this has any impact, say, from the top of the Jesuit property that people are going to look at or from the Douglas Preserve that people are going to look at that might be an impediment, or how do you feel about that? Well, I think we took a shot from the Douglas Preserve. No, you didn't get a shot from there, okay. Um, you know, certainly from the Jesuit property, you would be looking, you know, you're, you're at, a, at a slightly higher elevation, so you might be able to see it from that area where they hang glide. I think, again, the, the, you know, the nature of this roof, even though it's reaching to the, to the 30 feet, it's really a very small portion of that roof that's up at that point. And I would, I, I would hate to see us in the, you know, to try to squish this in, 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 in the process, really sort of violate the, the style that Mark and Kathy want out of this house. Again, we've, you know, we've tried to find that balance 
Um, and and I, I think that the fact that it's going to be the dark green slate roof, that roof is going to really tend to blend um, with the landscaping much more than if it were, you know, if I had a flat roof right up to the 30-foot elevation line. Um, uh, Tony, staff, I have a question for you. It has to do with the tower element. It appears that the roof of the tower penetrates the 30-foot element, the 30-foot line. Usually for architectural projections, we can take pieces through, but if there is interior space underneath that roof, we're not allowed to do that, or what's the classification? Uh, I think the way we've been interpreting it, if the tower is open down to the first floor, yes. so it doesn't add any second floor floor area, then we'll call it an architectural element. So this is all one volume? Yes. Yeah. So you can see that in the floor plan. So this is this is the, what's open to below. So the first, the second floor doesn't even reach into that into that tower or into that entry tower. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, I'll go to comments. There you go, Glenn. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, the garage. I don't know if there's a floor plan of the garage, but is it only one level? It's only one level, yeah. But what we are doing in the garage is installing lifts. So we're going to have the ability to park four cars in the garage. So that's why it has a little higher than normal plate. But I think, you know, given again the, the style that we're pursuing here, I think that, that that higher plate in some ways gives it a nicer um, proportion. Answer. Yeah, it's an answer. Uh, <laughs> you were supposed to make comments <laughs> and ask a question. I, I, have, I have 66 left tank that I want to be able to put out and, and drive once or twice a month. Yeah. It seems a little bit bulky because of the, the mass of the wall. And this roof, is this the same roof pitch as the main house? No, it's slightly less. So it's just reading a little massive in front of this house or this roof pitch could come down I mean the height well, of it's we could, I think we could study um, you know if we if we center the lifts exactly within this volume we probably could study lowering the plate slightly and 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 steepening the roof to make you know to make sure that those lifts work mm -hmm. and that you know that I'd be completely open to that any other comments from board members? I love that photograph that was in the book. That's it had a lot of other stuff in that photograph. Yeah, I mean, these, <laughs> you know, these images obviously don't do it justice beyond, the, you know, expressing the massing, but I think that it's very important to Mark and Kathy that the, the detailing here be authentic and that it really have yeah. that feeling of being an, of an older older home. Yeah, the one thing that I picked up on that was it had some really nice shutters and, and that kind of added subtlety to this mm -hmm. this mass here. Which I think that is something that, for instance, on the west side of the house, I mean, I'd like to put shutters where they actually could be used and would make sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is something that we could incorporate. Well, there you can see this actually should, you know, Actually, should let's go on to some other board members. Gary, do you have anything to add? No, it's okay. I'm used to being... Sure. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, yes, I, I do have one comment. I, I do appreciate the architecture, and I, it, it's very handsome. The building's very handsome. The only thing that concerns me is is perhaps the roof pitch on the single story uh, portion of the house. I think that. It's really close to, to our roof line on the second story element, and uh, I think that the, the height of that one, the, the single story element, is excessive. And also, he mentioned the fact that the, the, that the neighbor uh, was in favor of a single story element there, and yet this particular area of the house is, is quite high. Okay. Anything else? 
Mr. Chair, if I could back up a little bit, I do yep. have a question. Um, was a 20 closest home study done? Well, for the um, the slot size, that that's a guideline. We did look at the sizes in the in the neighborhood and the 20 closest homes, um, but we haven't done a formal cemental. Are, do you have photos of? Staff didn't ask for the 20 closest. I mean, the board can ask for it if you think it's needed. But since it's a guideline, we didn't ask for it. It's a real mixed neighborhood. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. Denise or Bernie, any questions or comments? Oh, Mr. Perry, just that would kind of, they'd be tall like that and they'd drop, you know, they'd drop down to a single level as well. And, and almost seeing that it could be a really great thing to to make that garage part of that, you know, as somehow dropping down to the to an attached garage or, I don't know, it's, um, it's just, it sort of ends there abruptly to me. I, I'm sorry, which elevation, are you talking about the north elevation, this? The north elevation. On the right hand side. I, I'm looking at this big one here. This, uh-huh. Thank you. Bernie, any comments? No? I will jump in with some comments. Um, the design is a beautiful design, the style of architecture. It, it's a tad on the large side. I mean, she was going there. What I kept on comparing was the hand sketch versus the computer model, and the hand sketch has just a little less wall mass and a little bit more window, and just had a little pointer style. And I know one's you know hand sketch, one's drawn, but there, it's a tad on the large side, and just leave it at that. The 30 feet is the maximum from the existing grade, so that if we add two feet worth of fill. Um, then the building will only be 28 feet tall, and that's just something you work out as you go further exactly. in the design. But there's a certain charm in looking in this home and then looking at this home, and it had to do with the window sizes, the amount of wall mass here and here, the size of this arch. I know they're two different things because one's a flavor, but the home to me appears a little bit on the bulky side. I drove through that neighborhood this morning and there are a lot of large homes and a lot of looming homes. So it's not going to be out of place for that neighborhood. It's what the neighborhood already is. But when you take it to the next step of refining the architecture, what I've noticed here was this thing comes down, this has a steeper pitch, whether it's 12 and 12, and if this is truly an interior volume, then you can lower this plate down and you don't have to have this plate because right now it looks like it's a bootleggable second floor that you can throw in an office or another room up there. But this can come down and it creates another variety of the architecture. So there's some fun playfulness that can happen here. The project works from, from the way that I see it. It's just um, molding the model a little bit more. Um, something I don't understand, but I don't need to understand it at this point, is how this all works. It looks a little awkward, but I'm sure when it gets reflushed out the next round, I'll understand this more. You're talking about the flat area. Well, this is very show. flat. The stairs go up. There's a yeah. deck on the second mm -hmm. floor, and it's just. But I don't have to. I was quickly. I can't understand it enough, but I don't need to. It's just a comment, just to throw out there. But I think this facade and this roof here, and then the comment about the garage. It's something you struggle with because I've done these auto lifts too and I understand completely. What I think might save you a little bit is picking up the window heights or making the windows a little bit taller here to sort of lessen the wall mass. And I don't know what kind of embellishment you can do around the garage door. 
and if if you are able to make it steeper and bring down the roof pitch a little I think bit. that would help. But that's the next round of massage. Um, those are my comments on what I see today. So with that, is the board comfortable with um, comments and be turning back to full board? Uh, there are no modifications, but you will have to go to, is it Planning Commission or is it just... I don't think we're going to have to go to Planning Commission. I'm assuming we're going to have a coastal exemption. Coastal exemption. Yeah. Okay. So I think as soon as, as soon as staff is ready for us to come back, we would want to do that. So with that, we can give you indefinite continuance based upon the comments on the architecture um, and return to full board with the next round of drawings. Okay. So does someone want to sum up all those ideas because I didn't write them all down? Or should we just wing it? All right. See, you did such a good job. I wasn't writing notes. Um, well, let's, no, no, I will do this. Um, Remember, always start with the positive. <laughs> it's, um, it's an incredible piece of sight that you have, piece of land, and the views are, will be incredible to enjoy. And the house that you have here is detailed and designed to take advantage of that. The structure appears to be a little massive and bulky, and the architect is encouraged to refine the style of architecture to reduce the apparent mass and to um, um, encourage to add more detailing to the project. Um, the project shall not exceed 30 feet from existing grade. Existing grade um, shall be shown on the elevations. The tower element um, currently exceeds 30 feet because it is a one-story architectural projection and the tower roof should be restudied to follow the vernacular of the architecture. The garage, thank you. Um, the architect shall re um, redesign the, the exterior of the garage to more, more blend with the architecture of the main house by lowering the roof plates and stiffening the roof pitch. The veranda, you guys know, you'll take care of that. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll, they'll take care of that. The next set of drawings should show the pool fencing, the next round of drawings, and um, any balconies and decks on the second floor. Um, Is the concern there of views to the neighbors, or because you were asking about that? It is views to the neighbors and how they will impede um, where this... The concern is the views of the neighbors' prop backyards and things. Okay. And is it, does it help you, again, because we've spent a lot of time with our two immediate neighbors, obviously, relative to reviewing those things and getting their input, or...? If they could sell the house. It's, I'm, I'm glad you got their input because they're not going to make your life more difficult here. All we have to do is make sure we look at it and say, you're right, it isn't going to be an issue okay. and we can let it go. Okay. But it's something that we like to look at. The concern was made at the, um, there's a single story roof element and it appears to be a two story structure on the neighbor and um, consider reducing the roof plate or just studying that as a single story roof. Mr. Chair, could I ask on that because obviously th that is governed in, ver in very large part by the veranda and, and the, you know, the one story character. So again, I, you know, we, we didn't, we're not, we're not striving to make this any taller than Time out. Okay. What you'll do is you'll come back the next time and you can explain why your design works. At this point, a question was made by a board member that this keep on calling it a single story. Okay, element. so I just, then I, mean, I would like it if it could be, unless the rest of the board agrees with that, I'd like it to be just recorded as one board member's comment because I didn't, I don't think that was a consensus at least of the. We'll say several or many. Do other people have a concern with this because I know I do. But I didn't study the I site. I think plan this enough. feels a little massive on that side, and dormers and other things so should be done most? over there. To or all? Well, I, I. Just draw them. I, I don't. We don't need to go there. Okay. The fact is, there is a concern here, and I didn't voice my opinion because it was said. 
your, the setback might be significant enough that it's not an issue. Just this is an issue that it is not a single story structure next to this the shots house or whatever it is and a concern was raised by one member and other members concur with that and we'll leave it at that and you can explain how it's not an issue or it is an issue and we'll review that the next time we're here and and that is all any other um, first and second and then discussions and any other comments I make the motion. Motion by Bernie. If I can. Second. Could, Second uh, by. Could we? Okay. Is it is it possible to come back in two weeks? We're not doing that anymore. We're just we're doing indefinite continuances. Whatever. I should ask staff. So you don't do you don't continue projects? I'm not prepared with my two weeks from now agenda. I could go get it, but I don't know off the top of my head if I have room on it or not. But it's generally not a problem to come back in. As soon as you resubmit, you usually get on the next meeting. Okay, well, we want to be, obviously, uh, then we'll work that out. Okay. So, any other discussions on the motion that was made? You may, because this is the time. Um, the We've spoken pretty extensively with the shots on this side, okay. and we've shown them the detail. of the, They've seen everything that you've seen here and they've expressed no concern at all about the size, bulk, or um, location uh, adjacent to their property. Okay. My, how I'll follow up on that is I didn't study this section that closely when I was going through the plans and the next time I will. And it might not be an issue. It was raised by one person because it was saw, saw by him and I concur that there's something that I need to look at here. And that's where I'll leave it. But that's... Mr. Chair? And yes. Um, yeah, just another response to that is, you know, people move and houses mm -hmm. get sold. So in general, we like to look at what kind of a precedent might you be setting here with the size of this house and the height of this house. And I know we're, you know, we've given some direction, and I'm hoping that next time you come, we'll be able to, you know, get it, everything resolved so you don't have to keep coming back. But my opinion, this is just my personal opinion, is I would like to see it scale down a little bit as a precedent setting piece of art. Okay. So is that just because of the square footage or? It's a combination of everything that I've seen. Okay. With that, Mr. all in Chair, favor of oops. We we have room on the next agenda. If you'd like to continue it two weeks, that would be okay. I'm okay with continuing it for two weeks. Is that okay with the motion maker? Bernie? And who is the second? Yes. We were going to continue it two weeks. Okay. I'll make that motion. Okay. Seconded by Gary. Great. So all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. See you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One copy? Yes. What's that? Trash. We'll take it in a few weeks. This is the wall. Never mind. <laughs> this is the this is that this is that wall. That's that wall. I never looked at the side panel. Yeah, the setback is twenty-five. Yeah, it was twenty-five feet. The setback? Yeah. We're now going to look at item six, which is 1429 Clareview Road. All right. You came in at six o'clock. All right. Well, thank you for coming early. I'm the property owner. Okay. Wait one minute. I have to read the agenda. Do I just need to put anything out here? Just to make that. This project is a proposal to permit an approximately 100 linear feet of an as-built retaining wall and a 330 square foot wooden deck and spa with stairs. The project will abate violations in the enforcement case. 
Staff hearing officer approval of a zoning modification to encroach into the required open yard area is requested. These are comments only. The project requires an environmental assessment and staff hearing officer approval. The address is 1429 Clearview Road. If you will un just announce your name for the record. My name is Amy Sachs and I am owner. My husband and I own the, um, okay. this site. Well, let's start, um, I guess, with some photographs. And then you can point to the photographs and where they happen on the site plan. Okay. So on this photograph here, that would be along this second, this furthermost retaining wall. And the deck is built up here. There's an oak tree here. I'll just start from the corner because it might make it okay. easier. This is an oak tree, an old oak tree, um, probably over 100 years old. Uh, this would be a deck that comes out along here, spa here. There's a retaining wall here, a retaining wall to create a planter here, a level area here, and another retaining wall here. The house is existing. None of this has been changed, and this was an existing two-foot retaining wall, existing stairs, and there was a landing here, that we so we just pretty much <clears throat> brought it out here a little bit. The uh, It's a 5,000-square-foot property, so 50 feet wide by 100 feet deep. Um, the house was built in 1929. Nothing has changed in so far as the house is concerned. Um, but we had no backyard to begin with, uh, or at least very little. And it was an unsafe landing with no um, railing. So what we did was we beefed up this front wall here. We brought the wall around here, went up a little bit to be able to create a level space. The second wall we put in over here on this side and then the deck above. This is a photograph of the house in the neighborhood and just showing you how it's on a 32% slope. This is a photograph of the deck, another one of the deck. Uh, I can't see this one, I'm sorry. And that's the stairways leading up to the deck. Question for you. It says here that you need um, staff hearing officer modification for retaining walls in the open yard. Yeah, you have to have... Well, you probably know this, 1,250 1, square feet of open level space. And it would be, the only way I had that before was the fact that there was a little wall here and this was all open. But it was completely unusable and I'd be happy to show you a photograph of what it looked like before. So, so you which of the actual retaining walls that need this encroachment? Uh, you would say, prob well, like, it would have to probably be, I guess, this one here. Because this was already existing and this was already existing. This was built and these were built. They have to be, I believe, more than 10 feet apart, if I'm not mistaken, and, or 20 linear feet completely left open. But it, it's not possible to do. You can see here's one grade here and another one here. So it's very steep here, and this was sort of the, the least amount of slope in the yard. It's very steep here. Okay. And then levels a little bit here, and then very steep in the front. Okay. And you can kind of see that the house was built in the least amount of grade. And this, we took advantage of the least amount of grade here okay, by so putting that level space in. We used um, Arizona flagstone with three inch joints to create um, permeability. Uh, French drains were put in all the way around. We used um, the same plaster as the wall, put in little Calavera tiles to make it decorative. This is not black, it is a brown, so it sort of blends with nature. We didn't do any funky color on the deck. We want it just to age and patina, and that's why we left kind of our old fence. Um, and we just kind of beefed it up and put in a little bit of a, um, a straight on the fence and put in a hedge that's growing in. And as a matter of fact, right now you can't even see underneath this deck at all. Um, any more so thank you so with that I will um, open public comment and we have two speaker slips first one will be Jenny Marshall followed by Jason Bryan if you have a seat right there in the microphone introduce yourself I'm Jenny Marshall. I live at 1215 um, West Mitchell Terrena, um, which is, um, uh, we, our house faces, our northeast picture windows face the backyard of the, um, the new deck and spa. Can you actually take this pen and draw a little dot on Mitchell Terrena? This is, 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 this
this is my house. And that's special training. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you know you're no, back you, this way. Yeah. You're back behind me. Yeah, this would be towards the that. hill that way. So this is clear view here. That's Mitchell Terena. Oh, You'd be a couple. I'm, right. I'm up behind. No, no, no. You're oh, right. no, I'm up behind. This is this Mitchell Terena how it did ends here. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I made it too complicated for you. I'll, you're, sorry about that. You're approximately right here. Yeah. Okay. Because your view looks... Yes, I look clear down. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Just get just flipped around. But you're have a, you have a window that looks... Yeah, our, our house has picture windows um, all along the side of the house facing that that directly over okay. um, that our neighbor um, and then her house okay so and basically um, in fact I can show you some pictures from our picture window to the screen and and the edge of the deck right there. Okay. And obviously we have a problem um, since we've had, you know, we have these great picture windows and now we have a deck in front of our picture windows and, and it's not a problem if no one's there, but if there are people up on the deck and I'm assuming that that's what will happen, um, then those people can just look right into our windows. Okay. So. Thank you. And we're going to keep these with the, okay. with the file. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up, and I wanted to add this to the file, was this is the original letter that we got when they first started doing the construction. And so we were not concerned. We thought this was kind of going to be a simple kind of construction. And it turned into something much more massive than what's indicated there. Okay. And you can add that copy as well. Thank you. Okay. And that was Jenny, followed by Jason Bryan. We'll just use the same green dot as I had before. Okay. <laughs> Actually, it's not. not, not it's you know, it is on the oh, goodness gracious. Right here, I'll, I'll no. correct it. <laughs> there you go. You got it. Our property is right here, and Jenny's is right on the other side. Okay. So that's kind of the, <laughs> the order there. Uh, my name is Jason Bryan. I'm the neighbor. Um, and I feel a little bit weird being here because, I mean, Amy and Mitchell have been good neighbors. I mean, the dogs say hi from through the fence and everything. Um, but I am a little concerned about uh, some of the new construction. Um, and part of it, I think, is, is we're, we live on a hillside, and it kind of gives weird angles to things because our house is down lower and the deck is up higher. So from the deck, you can see straight into the master bedroom and straight into the other bedroom as well, all, all the way through our house into the, the master bathroom. Um, so from sitting on our outside deck, if people, are, it doesn't happen very often. I've only seen like one big party up there, but when people are on that upper deck, the, the fence is cutting them off at about knee level um, from, from our kind of right outside the master bedroom area. So I don't know what, what the regulation is. I mean, you've offered to um, grow up the head so it's a little bit more of a, a, a privacy screen. Um, and then that's possibly a good solution. I just don't know how tall the hedge will go eventually and if that goes, there goes all of our view at the same time. So I'm, I'm concerned about the, the steps that we've seen so far and I'm just concerned about the privacy in our backyard and as was mentioned in the earlier um, hearing is um, what, what would happen to resale value down the road because we did have quite a bit of privacy before that, that isn't there before. And additionally there was some grading, some regrading on the property that um, is a little bit less of a concern but, but this whole area here was was built up considerably. It had sloped down before, um, so uh, there's a less privacy up here. And then where you really see it the most is just by this deck area here, because the stairs go up right along the fence line. And like I say, it's cutting off about knee level from from our line of sight. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So with that, any other public comments? Staff, are there any comments? Yes, Mr. Chair, this review is for comments to go to the staff hearing officer regarding the modification. And uh, the zoning staff is supportive of the open yard mod because they feel that the retaining walls allow the area to be used as intended by the requirement to have open yard. You know, it takes the steep slope and makes it more usable. Okay. But on the other hand, for this, the project also would require design review. I mean, it's triggered for design review because it's hillside and it's greater than 20% slope. And the retaining walls also require design review. So for this board's perspective, you should consider your good neighbor guidelines and the privacy 
issues and deck issues that you deal with. Thank you. With that, I will close public comment and return it to the board for questions. The board members have questions for they on this project. Yes, uh, I have a question. Um, I, I think it's more for Tony or the rest of the board. Um, our 15-foot setback from property line on, on, on decks, does that also relate to a, a freestanding deck or just one attached to a house or...? That's, well, it's specifically written to refer to second story deck. Second story deck. But, I mean, but if the deck's elevated sort of like this, then the, <laughs> the same issues come into play if this right. is elevated. Right. That's and that's, it's not, the 15 foot is a guideline, too, that has flexibility. I see. actually have a question for you. This deck right here, mm -hmm. when you're at basically the dirt, mm -hmm. how high is this deck elevated from the dirt that's happening here? It's built into the dirt. So you're built into the dirt, so yes. that's existing grade. When you come to here, you're like... The highest the deck goes ab above, like there's the retaining wall here, the highest it goes is about 3 feet 10 inches, I think. So 3 feet 10 inches, the deck above... In other words, it's pretty much built into the dirt up to about like uh, over on this side to about here-ish, and on this side to about here, I think it is. So, and, then, and then the slope takes a, a steep down and so that's why the bottom part but mostly it's sort of built in underneath the tree under the into the slope as much as possible so the tree is actually a, almost the ground sort of pops up from this bench here it just slopes right. like that you know and I might say in comments to privacy the fence is only a five foot fence maybe if it was a seven foot fence and if I had put more mature trees I wouldn't have my neighbors complaining right now I, maybe I would but I I can understand privacy, and until we saw that, you know, when you're looking down from watching it being built, it doesn't look very high, but then when you stand up on top of there, you see it could be a little higher and there could be a privacy issue, thus okay. maybe more mature trees could be helpful. Thank you. Or foliage of some sort. Any other questions from the board? If not, we'll move on to comments from the board members. This is for the modification for the open yard, as well as comments on the architecture. Mr. Chair, I'll make some comments. Um, seeing how this is done after the fact, we really wouldn't look at it from that point of view. So one thing I would say is that keep that in mind that we should be looking at this as a new project and as a new project in the hillside design guidelines the deck has quite a bit of understory and it is also driving this project um, to make it that the neighbors see what's going on above the fence line so my comment would be is that I think that perhaps the, the deck should be lower. Okay. Any comment about the encroachment into the open yard area? I'm, I'm okay with that. Thank you. Mr. Chair, um, I too am okay with the encroachment of the retaining wall. For the open yard, but have similar issues as Gary with the privacy issues that this deck being elevated creates between the neighbors. Um, and there may be solutions, um, but with what I see, I, I I think there are some issues. Okay, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, not only is this deck. Um, elevated but it's inside the, uh, the setback and I'm just having a lot of problems with this I I would not approve this project as it is
any comments on how to um, alter the design or redesign in a different way that would be more um, appropriate? Gary touched on that as far as lowering it. Um, perhaps it could be uh, a step deck where there's two levels. Um, those are my thoughts. Okay. Mr. Chair, um, I think the applicant actually made a, a good comment in saying, like, when we look at this picture from the neighbor where the people are at the corner of the deck, there's only that corner. I'm sorry, I need to put that by the TV camera. Okay. There's only that. It seems that that's the corner in question. And if she wanted to, on her side, she could put up a hedge, and no one's going to see that. And well, I'm instead sorry. of um, I, you know ripping down the whole thing, I mean, it, it, that, that is a solution. There is a tree there, so there it wouldn't be impeding anybody's view that they have already. Um, it would just be screening that that corner of the deck that's that's in the way. There's just one little corner there. It's not really that visible. Uh, question for the board members. Did anyone visit the site? I have been on the site. Before. Oh, okay. Um, I actually went and looked at it a couple days ago. Hi. Anybody else? Okay. Can I see the aerial photo? Any comments, Brian? Okay. Her options. What I would say is um, the project you went forward without getting a building permit, and so now you're trying to, after the fact, we're reviewing it, and maybe the rules changed July of last year. But if you got your permit in June of last year, it would have been a different set of guidelines that would have been applied to you. Um, now we have to look at it today as the way it is and how we apply the current rules to it. So there are some concerns. I would think that there are possibly some mitigated ways that you can resolve it, whether there's additional planting or a new fence. We don't see that on these drawings. So what I would recommend is that our comments here would be enough for the majority of the board is okay or is supportive of the retaining walls and the open yard requirement, which takes care of the staff hearing officer, but then come back to full board addressing some of the concerns we have with the location of the deck, the size of the deck, and address those issues as a separate matter. Um, there is a concern that the deck is already past your setback area, um, and then there's a concern that when people are here, they're going to be involved or potentially bothering this neighbor, which when, as soon as you elevate yourself higher, it exacerbates the problem. So I would say along this elevation, whatever it is, that this needs to be addressed. Um, Can I say one thing that I was told or not yet? Not yet. Okay. Um, there was a concern about the understory. The understory is actually the part that you can see from underneath here. And that needs to be addressed this aesthetically. You have landscaping there. It's not quite grown in. Um, some people think that you might want to lower it. So there's two thoughts there. Just say that the understory needs to be addressed. One thing that you have is you're in high fire, or I should ask the question, are you in high fire? Not to my knowledge. Not to your knowledge, OK. Because that changes the way you build if it was high fire. Um, I noticed when I walked on Mitchell Torina Street, that your thing sticks out really hard and you can see your understory and it's just your it's a major wedge that comes out so visually this was a concern for me as i was coming up the road i know the road gets higher but looking into and across this neighbor into your neighbor the lack of landscaping here hurts you and so maybe that would take care of some of the concerns um, but overall the board is supportive of going on to the staff hearing officer and taking care of this issue. But you will have to come back addressing some of our concerns that were raised about the deck. Okay. You may. Okay. Um, the deck, just so you know, doesn't really start jetting out more than 18 inches in height at this point. Thus, we kind of wedged it off here and to make this look symmetrical. And I was told so long as it's not above 18 inches of height, it can go in within the setback. 
you are correct, and you're playing by the rules. So, take so here I'm, I'm fine. It's, it's, this is where it starts to rise a bit. That's, we cut it off. So that it is no more than 18 inches. Now put yourself on this side of the table. We didn't know that by looking at it. Okay. Well, you could be three and a half feet off the ground with a four right. foot fence. And right. So. Because the slope from here to here is pretty steep. So we really did our best to build that deck into the land mm -hmm. so that it would not appear high. And, and I really do think camouflaging with some foliage or trees. I know this oak tree was just recently severely cut on the bottom because you used to not be able to see the entire side. And, um, you know, which is fine because somebody wants views and stuff, which is great. But, you know, there was a huge tree, beautiful oak tree that was all filled out and you couldn't see any of that from the side street at all. Mitchell Terena here. So foliage does make a big difference. Okay. So is there any other comments from board members? Mr. Chair, I need to make a uh, staff comment. I saw the 18 inches, and it's always been my understanding that zoning staff has made the call that if you're less than 10 inches above grade, they consider it to be on grade. I've always heard the number 10 inches, not 18 inches. Okay. So we need to be sure about that. I've I'm just going to let you resolve that okay. issue, but you have to have drawings that express what's going on. And if it's 10 inches, then 10 inches is the number, but there is a concern, as you understand from mm -hmm. our perspective, mm -hmm. and realize that when a neighbor across the street is building next to your mom's house, that we'll take these same concerns in dealing with the neighbor as mm -hmm. well as to someone else's mm -hmm. house. So with that, um, I'd like to f entertain a motion f um, returning back to full board. Um, with positive, with um, comments to the staff hearing officer that the board is supportive of the retaining wall encroachment into the open yard requirement and request that the applicant study the deck layout in its relationship to the property lines and privacy issues with the neighbors. Consider lowering the deck or providing mature landscaping to um, provide privacy and a plan and indicate on the plan the height of existing walls and fences along the perimeter. The applicant to address the understory of the deck above the retaining wall, which would be this point right here. Would this be addressing the understory? Um, you really have lattice there, or no, is this I, being I proposed? No, this is being proposed. Okay, then that's. Um, I didn't catch that. I always I was going by the photo. I mean, I didn't want to do anything if you're going to tell me. You know what I mean? I haven't. No, that's fine. Um, I'll let it stand. If, if this is how you want to address it, then then that's then that's how you're planning on addressing it. I didn't catch that. Okay. Okay. Um, first and a second, and any additional comments from board members? Made by Bernie. Second by Denise. Are there any comments that people have? Any any additional comments to the motion? Hearing none. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed. The motion carries. So your next step is the staff hearing officer, and then come back to here addressing those concerns that we made. Okay. And thank you, neighbors who came and brought photographs. Very important. Thank you. Can I get those other photos? on the last item of the agenda and we're two minutes early so would you mind waiting no. <laughs> um, item seven which is 435 Bath Street the proposal is to abate an enforcement case to bring up the property up to code the proposal includes an addition of 357 square feet of habitable second story with stair access a new roof and walls 
the existing 1,352 square foot single family residence, including a 215 square foot one car garage, is located on a 4,522 square foot lot. The proposed total of 1,709 square feet is 73% of the maximum FAR. Action may be taken if sufficient information. We have your name for the record and green lights on. Good. And your presentation. I'm Brian Murphy, the architect on the project. This is Dario Pini, the owner. Um, the uh, property is a single family house um, in a CP zone uh, right on the corner of Bath and. Uh, Rio Street, Haley. Haley. Sorry, um, and um, the uh, freeway off ramp is just down here. Um, you come down here, and you, you turn left and go under the bridge. Um, so um, we have an existing house that um, has um, some attic space that's a little bit problematic um, over over time. It, it's almost habitable, but. Um, People like to um, rent the building and then and then move on up there and, and inhabit it. So, in order to um, to make it meet um, uh, habitable requirements, we, we're proposing to um, add some some additional um, wall areas and some new roof areas to um, provide uh, sufficient heights. Um, the concept was to to try and um, preserve the essential character of the of the house, especially. Um, to the front here, which is the, um, the uh, Bath Street elevation, and um, let this existing dormer look up there um, and have the new roof happen behind it rather than affecting this dormer. So that, that dormer is looking into the, as a part of the existing roof, and that area becomes a piece of a closet. So the building has currently some cross gables running the other direction, so my proposal was to um, to uh, put some additional cross cables, lift it up, and sort of stack them, as it were. Oops, not that one, this one. Stack them over the uh, over the cross cables in the other direction, and allow the the roof to um, step up behind um, and not interfere with um, the essential character of, of what was going on. Repeating the details of the way the um, the uh, eaves are, are forming, the way the, the shingles are working, the siding. Leaving this portion of the roof alone, taking this, lifting it up a little bit, having that cross cable run this way, and then lifting up the piece that follows the main <coughs> main uh, form of the roof there. So that would entail some new walls, um, but not a lot of new wall space. Uh, most of the wall gets pretty much buried into that existing roof. Um, most of our most of our height is is there. We're almost to a full story as it is. This is the line of what was existing. This is how much we're coming up above it, obviously. We're six inches short. We have one point up there for a full story. Great. All righty. So with that, I will um, open public comment, seeing nobody, because there is none. Are there any letters, Tony? So I will close public comment. Are there any staff comments? No staff comments. Return it to the board for comments. I have, or I'm sorry, questions. We have questions. I'll jump in first. Okay. Uh, oh, go. Are you uh, proposing to change that chimney? We're extending it. It's it's got a metal portion of the chimney that comes up beyond the brick. Currently, we're going to extend that metal portion slightly so we meet our our height requirement. This bothered me in elevation. This little dog leg. I was trying to understand why it was necessary, why why you couldn't make that a straight line. Well, there's an existing bath in there currently, and we're trying to make that bath large enough to well, it's a half bath. We're trying to make it large enough to become a full bath, and so I'm tucking it in under the the eave line without creating another roof element. Um, Does this window exist? Yeah. So I still don't understand the. I don't understand if this doesn't exist, why can't this wall come out to here and change the symmetry of the room and, 
it could, but um, it, it changes the symmetry, and I wanted to preserve that symmetry and, and make it make it work with with the, the symmetrical line there. So I'm stepping back beyond. So I'm letting this run through on that same center of the of the existing ridge, and then I'm stepping this wall just just a foot or so beyond that to to get the additional space I need in that room above. All of which again happens above the roof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my really only my only question. Any questions or comments from the board members? Assume that colors to match existing and detailing to match existing. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, just one question. Um, maybe just clarification. Some of these windows here seem to be drawn as sliders versus maybe some of the double hung elements that are down below. There is a mixture on the building. Um, what do you think would be more historically appropriate? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't think it's sliders. <laughs> Probably would be, but uh, they, they certainly function a little easier for us. Th these are, e is this the egress window for that room? Uh, yes. Actually, maybe I guess this one is a little higher. So maybe too high. So the a double hung may not work egress was there. I don't think it would. No, I don't think we'll so. Have to clear Mr. Chair? Yes. Question. Um, does he need to have handrails on the front porch? We're not touching the front porch. It was built back in uh, 1917. Right, I understand. It doesn't, it's legal long before it. Correct. Okay. It's also not over 30 inches above finished grade. That could be too. Mr. Chair? Yes. I'm having a little problem with the, with the way that the roof line goes, looking at it from the front elevation, looking at it from the street. Which front? The one on Haley? We're looking at the northeast, the front porch elevation. This one, okay. And it, it really looks, it looks to be a bit lopsided. It, it, it seems out of character to me, the, um, the roof lines on that. To follow up on that, this plane here and this plane, are they the same? Yes. And is this plane in front of this plane? Yes. There's a bay that is the current dining room that projects out. It actually um, projects out. Mm -hmm. Existing um, non conforming encroachment into the set, front yard set back there. It's a dining area. Mm -hmm. our, our new line conforms obviously to the setback it is. is in that line there. There's a second chimney, whether it's a furnace or, or something, back there. Yeah, I think it was an abandoned it's furnace. an abandoned thing. Oh, yes. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a comment. Um, there's a couple little little things that you've mentioned, and Gary has mentioned. Maybe the the roof one is not little, but yeah. um, <laughs> but I, I think generally they've done a pretty good job of tucking this second floor in on a uh, on a house. So I I think I can support the concept here. Yeah.
dovetail on there that I can support it too. It's a little hokey here, but there's always been hokiness built in craftsman style houses. I would prefer to see this line come across here. Uh, well, you know what, you can study that, but from the from the elevation, it's just going to look odd. With this only a six inch overhang and that being 24. Your staircase, this is all centered, it's balanced. Um, I don't think it costs it. Well, I'll just have you study it. We don't have a problem making that go across. We can make that into a closet. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. I think it would look better straight. And then the perception of the roof plan, I don't think anyone will perceive. Either it's just jogs. Yeah, because I mean, only if you're in an airplane are you going to realize that this plane and this plane don't line no. up. Right. As long as you don't get higher than this ridge, then you have a different associated right. problem. But you can always lower that plate or play games. Just one of those things that only architects see. And worry about. <laughs> um, so, Gary, any um, any other comments? Is this, is is your opinion strong enough to prevent it from moving on, or strong enough concerns? Well, I don't really have a solution. Any other comments from that end? You have great improvement to those people who will live there mm -hmm. and have the, the space made into habitable space. So for the board's question, if this was to receive preliminary approval and final and consent, would that be okay with the board? Consent, calendar guy? Please me. Okay. Then I will uh, entertain a motion for preliminary approval for the project with the following comments. That the color and detailing to match the existing structure. That the um, window at the second floor by the bathroom, the wall be resolved with the um, back up. Back up. Northwest elevation on the right hand side that the, the walls at the second floor align. And that is all. And to return to the consent calendar for final. Can we have a first and a second? MPO comments. MPO making MPO findings that it's uh, historically blends with the existing structure, compatible with the neighborhood. It's an understated second story addition, and uh, it's appropriate. Mr. Chair, um, on the chimney, is the chimney going to be extending through the new No, it's not a, actually. Uh, touching any of the new roof areas, oh, okay. it's just that it needs to be a certain amount higher than this closest piece of roof. So, so we need to extend that metal chimney up just a little bit further. Provide additional information about how to extend the chimney. That's fine. We'll do it no, it's it's okay. Oh, okay. Could <laughs> uh, be a little bit of an engineering. Oh, First and a second on that motion. First by Bernie, second by Aaron. Okay. Um, you'll have some interesting things having to do with structural on the second floor, but that's. <laughs> so with that, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. You have it. Thank you very much. Like a yeah, it would. It include a comment. I think that's a nice include a comment use, about the chimney to provide additional fighting, trying to get commercial detail information about the chimney. Temporary use for commercial. Fired up. And there start. is time out for a minute. There's a 10-day appeal period for anybody who is concerned by that. We tried. And other than that, I will adjourn the meeting.